We are very happy to be here this morning, inspired by Mozart, to be here at this historical moment to discover and explore what our world demands from us to get out of its mortal danger. We do believe that only change is permanent, and therefore, we all came to improve ourselves to face the challenge to create a win-win world, the future of humanity as a creative human species in the universe, the battlefield, the very battlefield of Lyndon LaRouche. This first panel is composed as a chorus of voices from the whole world, patriots and world citizens. A time for strategic upheaval will Europe be able to help change the new paradigm? Let me welcome our six speakers. First, Wen Wei Dong, Minister Councillor, Director of the Commerce and Trade Department at the Chinese Embassy in Germany. Natalia Vitrenko, leader of the Progressive Socialist Party of Ukraine, <laughs> former member of parliament and presidential candidate. <laughs> Professor Andrei Ostrovsky, <laughs> deputy director of the Institute of Far Eastern Studies of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Professor Enzo Siviero, <laughs> eCampus University, Italy, director. Leonidas Chrysantopoulos, ambassador at Honorem Greece. <laughs> and Colonel Alain Corvez, International Constantant of International Strategy, France. <laughs> the seventh speaker I do not need to introduce. She is known by us all, El Gazep Larouche, chairman of our Schiller Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of the Schiller Institute, I cannot open my remarks without addressing the unprecedented events taking place in the United States right now. With the so-called impeachment proceedings, what is happening in that country is actually an attempted coup against the elected president and regime change by the same forces who are conducting the effort of regime change in Hong Kong and in Bolivia. And it is very clear they want to get out Trump out of office uh, by all means. And the intention becomes very clear if you look at the testimony of such people as the uh, diplomat Taylor, George Kent, uh, Fiona Hills, and others who made unbelievable assertions which have absolutely nothing to do with uh, reality. Taylor, for example, uh, lied, saying that President Trump, in collusion with uh, President Zelensky, delayed the delivery of heavy military equipment to <coughs> Ukraine and in that way causing many lives, many Ukrainian lives to die by not deterring the Russian aggression. This is a complete upside down situation. And, you know, um, if you think in terms of what happened, you know, with the coup uh, in Maidan in 2014, which I think Natalia will, will speak about or can ask, answer any questions you may have, uh, it is all the more impertinent what uh, George Kent said. He said that the forces opposing Russia in Ukraine 
are to be compared to the Minutemen of the American Revolution and are like heroes like the Marquis de Lafayette and Baron von Steuben in the American Revolution. Now, this is so absolutely outrageous. This is like 100% the opposite of what this proud tradition of Lafayette and von Steuben was, that one only can call it satanic. If you turn the truth so upside down and you turn it into the absolute contrary, it can only be called satanic. Because the people who committed the coup in Ukraine and who are the enemies of Russia are people in the tradition of Stepan Bandera, the Nazis. And we all remember the infamous words of Victoria Nuland, who said that the State Department spent five billion people, uh, five billion dollar in order to finance uh, this opposition uh, in Ukraine. At the same time, less important but significant for the new spirit in the neocon and neoliberal circles in the United States, the US-China Economic and Security Review came out with their annual report denying China's statehood by saying that they would call President Xi Jinping no longer president, but they would call him general secretary of the Communist Party. I mean, this is worse than McCarthyism, and uh, the only good thing is this coup is not yet decided because the coup plotters are under criminal investigation by Attorney General Barr, and they may all end up uh, being prosecuted and eventually end up in jail. Now, what is going on in the United States is, as I said, a policy of coup, coup d'etat and regime change, as we are seeing it, uh, have seen it in many countries around the world, and what is now happening in Hong Kong and in Bolivia. And if you compare that to what the mass media in Europe are saying, it could not be uh, more incredible uh, in terms of really a kind of, uh, I would always almost say, Goebbels-like propaganda. It is very clear that this is showdown time. What is behind all of that is the effort by forces of the old oligarchical paradigm against the emergence of a completely new paradigm in the history of mankind. Now, this conference is devoted to the memory of my late husband, the great statesman, economist, visionary and human being, Lyndon LaRouche, but not as something belonging to the past, but as a solemn commitment to keep his ideas alive and make them spread, since they represent the indispensable solution he has proposed for the ex existential problems which we as a human civilization are facing today. The solutions he has proposed are absolutely realizable, but they require a completely different mindset than most governments of Europe and populations have today. In order to transform that mindset from one which can only lead to catastrophe to one which the otherwise which is the otherwise easily available solutions can be realized, the understanding of the scientific method of Lyndon LaRouche is absolutely indispensable. It is that method which is the reason why he was the most successful forecaster and of all the many examples where he was right and all of his critics were wrong, let me choose maybe one of the most far-sighted examples. In August 71, when President Nixon destroyed the Bretton Woods system by replacing the fixed exchange rate system with one of floating exchange rates, he said prophetically, if this trend in monetary policy is continued, down the road, <coughs> you will, it will lead to the danger of a new depression and fascism or a just new world economic order. And we are exactly at that point today. Now, that trend he warned of was continued. And he warned at each turn of the consequences and also proposed each time a remedy, 
which did shape the course of history, even if the transatlantic sector rejected his solutions. This trend was continued in the policy of the Council of Foreign Relations of the so-called controlled disintegration of the world economy of the 70s, which resulted in the destruction of the full industrial chain in the United States. And the kind of Chilean model which we see exploding today in many countries around the world. The outsourcing of production into cheap labor markets, the high interest rate policy of Paul Volcker, the change from the physical economy to a shareholder value society, Thatcherism and Reaganomics, the repeal of Class Steagall Act, the deregulation of the financial markets, the policies of quantitative easing after the crash of 2007-2008, and now the negative interest rate, and lastly, helicopter money, and what the governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, is proposing, regime change, eliminate the power of sovereign government, and go to a global dictatorship of the central banks, which would impose legislation to channel all financing into green investments combined with bailouts, bail-in, brutal austerity, leading to a massive population reduction. Now we see this last phase of uh, since mid of September. Please give me the triple curve. Uh, this is a pedagogical um, graph which Lynn developed in 95, which shows you at the point where the financial aggregates are going completely out of control. According to the la latest figures of the BIS on the over-the-counter derivatives, notional amounts of those derivatives rose by 20% since 2018 till June of this year to 640 trillion. And they are generally uh, at least twice that official figure as compared to an increase of global trade of 3% and a BIP of 2.9%. According to the Federal Reserve data quoted by the blog Economica, uh, the Fed's assert assets increased by 300 billion uh, to 4.4%. 04 trillions since September 17th. But since the excess reserves of that mega banks on deposit at the Fed are lower than August, so that means that the newly printed money went straight into speculation of all kinds, uh, into stocks, bonds, debt, securiza de debt securizations, interest rate derivatives, and so forth. So therefore, Ben Bernanke's claim that quantitative easing would only build up excess bank reserves, assuring it would never cause hyperinflation, was clearly a lie. Global financial aggregates break the 1.8 quadrillion going towards 2 quadrillion uh, towards the end of the year. Next graph. <clears throat> so you can actually see that we are uh, at a point, you know, 2008, uh, this peaked, then you had the crash, and now we are actually uh, at the same level, but uh, going actually beyond. So all the instruments of the toolbox uh, Chancellor Merkel has talked about in 2008 have been used up. So why did Frau Merkel all of a sudden change her opposition to the idea of a European banking union and the EU deposit insurance fund during her recent trip to Rome? I think that the Fed, Draghi, Lagarde, Carney, Scholz, Merkel, they all know that the system is bankrupt, bankrupt beyond belief. But they are betonköpfe, troglodytes, as Jamie Dimon just demonstrated in an imitation of Erich Honecker, uh, who said on the 14th of August of 1989, when he was talking about socialism to stay around for another thousand years, the US economy is the most prosperous economy in the, the world has seen, and it's going to be very prosperous for the next 100 years. We should remember that it took only two months before Honecker was toppled after his famous statement that socialism would be around for another 1,000 years, and then three months until the Berlin Wall fell. 
This system is absolutely not sustainable. We are on the verge of a general breakdown crisis of the world monetary system, exactly as Lyndon LaRouche has warned. We are at the point he predicted in 1971, depression and fascism, or a just new world economic order. And you see right now a rebellion <clears throat> uh, worldwide in the form of mass demonstrations against these policies in Chile, Haiti, Iraq, Pakistan, Lebanon, the German farmers that you had, uh, then you had the election victory of President Fernandez and Vice President Kirchner in Argentina against these neoliberal policies on the one side and the replay of the State Department supported Maidan coup against President Evo Morales because he dared to follow the Chinese example of lifting the population out of poverty with the help of scientific progress and even attempting to leapfrog to the most advanced technologies. The social effects of, these, of this neoliberal economic policy is destroying the social fabric of countries around the globe. Because several countries in the G20 are in fact defending the British Empire, the city of London, Wall Street, and the central banks, the solution, I'm afraid, will not come from the G20, which would be the representative organization which should have taken on the organ reorganization of the system when the system systemic crisis erupted in 2008. But they did not. They made it worse with their policy since. This is why Lyndon LaRouche already in, I think, 97 insisted that only if the combination of the United States, Russia, China, and India as the core representative nations would be strong enough to impose a new credit system, a new Bretton Woods system. The strategic cooperation between Russia and China actually has been strengthened to an unprecedented level as a result of the failed effort to impose an unipolar world. And we will hear from Professor Ostrovsky uh, more on that. Uh, <clears throat> as the new form of the British Empire after the disintegration of the Soviet Union. India moved closer, and there are several organizations which developed really as a backlash to this empire, such as the BRICS, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Belt and Road Initiative, and others. So the potential of such a cooperation exists. But I'm not certain if they have a contingency plan to act, uh, to, to put the right solution on the table, the new Bretton Woods system, uh, before the system blows up. You see all kinds of measures they take, moving out of the dollar, organizing trade in bilateral currencies, uh, buying gold, setting up cyber currencies. But that is not adequate to the problem because, and this is a debatable uh, point, if the United States is not part of the solution, it will collapse. And I do not think that such a collapse would be anything like the disintegration of the Soviet Union. It is more likely than not that out of a disorderly collapse of the global financial system, there would be war. What is needed instead is the implementation of Lyndon LaRouche's four laws, a global Glass-Steagall system, a banking separation where almost all of the outstanding derivatives and unpayable debt are written off. The commercial banks are being put under government protection, and then in each nation, the national bank is created in the tradition of Alexander Hamilton and the Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau in Germany in the post-war reconstruction period. Third, a new international credit system, a new Bretton Woods, and fourth, an international cooperation in a crash program for the realization of thermonuclear fusion power and space research, travel, and the colonization of the cosmos. I know that leading individuals in Russia and China are very skeptical, skeptical about the possibility to get the United States into the kind of cooperation I'm speaking about. And I know the present obstacles, but that potential is absolutely there. The entire reason why British intelligence, especially the GCHQ, were, quote, alarmed about the Trump campaign 
uh, pro-Russian pro stance and context already in the fall of 2015. They conspired with Obama's US intelligence apparatus because they recognized in Trump the potential of participating in a new system of sovereign nation states. They ingrained deeply in the mindset of the British Empire, which has taken over the American neoliberal establishment according to the guidelines of H.G. Wells' open conspiracy, smelled the threat that he could represent for their system. And for, though, for sure, these circles, the Anglo-American military industrial complex uh, <clears throat> attacked, uh, who, uh, who Trump attacked recently by name, had nightmares when they heard Trump speak at the General Assembly of the United Nations this year. Trump said, looking around and all over this large and magnific magnificent planet, the truth, plain, the truth is plain to see. If you want freedom, take pride in your country. If you want democracy, hold on to your sovereignty. And if you want peace, love your nation. Wise leaders always put the good of their own people and their own country first. The future does not belong to the globalists. The future belongs to the patriots. The future belongs to sovereign and independent nations who protect their citizens, respect their neighbors, and honor the differences that make each country special and unique. That outlook is actually, in principle, the per in perfect cohesion with the spirit of the new Silk Road, which is based on the idea of perfect respect for the sovereignty of each nation and acceptance of the other social system. And it is not in contradiction to the vision of President Xi Jinping, shared, a shared community for the future of mankind. The kind of thinking, that kind of thinking is the absolute horror vision for the forces of the British Empire because it overcomes geopolitics and it establishes the ground for the pursuit of the common goals of mankind. I remember the reaction of the German defense minister Ursula von der Leyen the morning after Trump, Trump's election victory in 2016. She said she was in deep shock that this man had won. Now she is the president of the EU commission as uh, of December 1st, and in a recent speech in front of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Berlin, she projected her British-inspired demeanor of imperialism by falling back into a confrontational Cold War tone by pushing deterrence. Europe has to learn this, the language of power. She has to build up her military muscle. Against whom? Against what she calls autocratic regimes whose unrestrained shopping tours must be stopped, in an obvious reference to China. She, was, she also wants to put forward a Green New Deal in the first 100 days of her office and push taxation on CO2 emissions so high that people change their behavior. With other words, at a point when Merkel is turning over the last remnants of sovereignty about the own economy to the EU, to the total detriment of the German population, von der Leyen intends to impose a green economic policy which will destroy any industrial economy in Europe for reasons elaborated by Linde LaRouche and which we can take up in the discussion. In light of the pending financial economic catastrophe, it is as lunatic as unfeasible when Annegret Kramp-Karrenbauer announces that she wants to send the Bundeswehr into the Pacific as a counterforce to China. As she recently declared at the Bundeswehr Academy in Munich, fitting perfectly with the Cold War outlook expressed in the Indo-Pacific Strategy Report of the US Department of Defense of June 1st of this year. The Bundeswehr is collapsing, so if the German economy collapses, the Bundeswehr is in trouble to, to make these kinds of policies. It's just complete madness. So why is all of this? Uh, th in this policy, which can only lead to war with Russia and China, is that in the interest of Germany? 
This is nothing but the old geopolitical agenda of the great game of Lord Palmerston of the British Empire against Russia and its successor, Helford Mackinder, the official author of geopolitics, the imperial idea that those who control the heartland of Eurasia control the world at the expense of the Atlantic Rim countries, which was, among other things, the reaction of the British Empire to the Trans-Siberian Railway at the end of the 19th century. This junk, as well as the evil book of Samuel Huntington, The Soldier and the State, belongs to the required curriculum of the officer training of the armed forces of the United States and entertainment literature for the empire faction on both sides of the Atlantic. This is the outdated mindset of that system which is about to disintegrate. It is the backward-oriented geopolitical thinking that relations among nations is a zero-sum game and what the proponent of that system mean when they insist on a, quote, rules-based order instead of the international law of the UN Charter, they really mean the justice of the Trasimachos of Plato's Republic, that the rules which define the advantage of the stronger must prevail, and that therefore the dominance, dominant role of that power must be maintained. Since President Xi Jinping put the new Silk Road on the agenda in 2013 in Kazakhstan, a program which is in complete cohesion with the development programs Linda LaRouche has worked on since the beginning of the 70s, a very different model of international relations has been established. The BRI has developed into the largest infrastructure program in history ever, about 157 nations and 30 large international institutions are participating in this project, which basically intends to, uh, <clears throat> to replicate the poverty alleviation program successfully implemented in China and in other developing countries. Despite the recently escalating anti-China campaign by the same politicians, intelligence agencies, and think tanks that are supporting the coup against President Trump and some putting the brakes on the side, uh, on the side of uh, the EU, according to the Chinese news portal Sina.com, the China, uh, China Railway Corporation has a total of 6,300 trains that making the journey from Europe, China to Europe in 2018, an increase of 72% compared to the previous year. On, of these, 2,690 trains made the return trip to China up 111% on the year. Since 2011, China has sent more than 11,000 freight trains to Europe as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. A total of 65 freight, freight rail routes have been opened between Chinese cities and 44 cities in 15 European countries in select routes. Uh, next graphic. <clears throat> uh, compared uh, to practically none 10 years ago. The most frequent route is Chongqing, Duisburg, with now 39 trains arriving in Duisport every week. Among the cities served in Europe, served by freight trains from China, are Duisburg, Hamburg, Nuremberg, Lyon, Madrid, Vienna, Prague, Trieste, Budapest, Tilburg, and especially Duisburg has saved as a central hub for rail freight, uh, rail freight in Europe, with many destinations reached from there. Next graphic, oh, that's the, the left one. In addition to rail freight coming from Europe, from China, directly on land, freight is also handled on rail routes going into the European landmass from the European seaports, of which presently Piraeus, Rotterdam, and Hamburg are the most important ones in terms of seaborne cont containers arriving from China. So rather than opposing the BRI, European nations and the United States should take up Xi Jinping's offer of a win-win cooperation, not only on a bilateral basis, but especially joint operations uh, for larger projects, such as the economic reconstruction of Southwest Asia 
the industrialization of Africa and Latin America, and not least, the modernization of infrastructure in the United States and Europe. To address the immediacy of the danger of a blowout of the financial system, it must be done exactly what La Rouge has demanded since decades. A new system must be adopted by the US and European nations, which repudiates all the post-71 changes in the global financial, monetary, and trade policies, which I mentioned in the beginning, and they must suddenly adopt a new credit system, a new Bretton Woods system of ex uh, fixed exchange rates. Like the old Bretton Woods system, <coughs> which uh, Churchill and Truman had distorted uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt's intention to end colonialism, it emphatically must include long-term uh, credit with low interest rates for the industrialization of the developing sector. The fact that China, Russia, and India, and many other countries are cooperating already with the BRI does create the setting where such a change is absolutely feasible. If President Trump, who has rejected the British doctrine of geopolitics, can beat back the coup in process against him, and if Attorney General William Barr continues with his criminal investigation of the coup plotters, the fact that there is a US president who embraces the principle of sovereignty and patriotism will represent the kind of path for Europe to align with the perspective of a Eurasian economic integration from Vladivostok to Lisbon, mentioned by President Putin recently again. For this to happen, it requires the kind of shift in the mindset of a significant part of the population in the United States and Europe which goes to the essence of the life work of Linda LaRouche. It requires a rejection of the underlying axioms of thinking of the oligarchical model and replace it with the notion that man is set apart from all other species by a quality of mind which can be most easily called cognition. It is that quality which no animal has which enables man again and again to make qualitative discoveries of new physical principles, which increases man's power over the universe per capita and per square kilometer. The great Russian scientist, Pobis Kuznetsov, recognized the significance of LaRouche's discovery of the concept of potential relative population density and the related concept of an increase of the energy flux density in the production process as a measuring rod for the durable sustainability of a society. And he predicted that since many discoveries have been given the name of their discoverer, like Watt, Ampere, the LaRouche concept would be called the La in future science. To master this scientific method is key to the understanding of the success of his economic forecasting. In the clarity, Unmatched by any other thinker of Western science, he identified the crucial battle of ideas between the mind-deadening follies of a purely mathematical and linearized physical doctrines of the Euclidean tradition of Galileo, Ptolemaeus, Copernicus, Tycho Brahe, Newton, Euler, Gauss, Gauchy, up to the 20th century of Russell, Wiener, and von Neumann. Contrasting that, with the internal history of the Platonic tradition of the anti-Euclidean science from Nicolaus of Kuhs, Kepler, Fermat, Huygens, Huygens, Leibniz, and others. He pointed to the significance of the mistaken and allegedly self-evident principle of shortest distance of the fraction of light as compared to the physical experimental principle of shortest time. And Leibniz's concept, extension of this to his experimental principle of universal least action as the proof that any true discovery of new physical principles can only come out of the second tradition. The reason why his works are so crucial to science today is because they provide a method to identify the pathway to the absolutely necessary next higher level discovery by putting a scientist a scientist in a Riemannian mindset, 
which allows for a non-deductive solution to paradoxes out of uh, the established beliefs so far. It is absolutely unique to LaRouche that he has demonstrated the crossover between relativistic physics and the creativity of the human mind as such and the connection of that domain to classical forms of art and statescraft. Lynn provided ample proof that it is only through classical forms of poetry, drama, and music that those faculties of the mind capable of generating valid hypotheses of new insights into the lawfulness of the universe are developed. Why in music, po poetry, and drama, the same battles against reductionist and deductionist conceptions have to be fought, and why therefore the quality of metaphor, irony, and Fortwängler's idea of playing between the notes are so crucial to elevate the mind into that higher Riemannian mindset. With that goes the education of the emotions out of the realm of the sensual and profane up to the level of agapic passions. With the oligarchical model of society and image of man reduces the individual to a creature of hedonistic desires, easily manipulated and accepting the role of the underling, underling by the powers of Trasimachus' rule-based order, it is the cognitive experience associated with classical forms of composition which set the individual free by evoking the beauty of the mind and unleashing the kind of agapic love for mankind which is necessary to choose the new paradigm of, one, of, of the one humanity leaving the narrow-minded evil pursuit of alleged geopolitical interest of a privileged class at the expense of the lower classes behind. It is the unparalleled richness and importance of Lin's life's work for the solutions of the existential challenges to, of today and the vision of a truly human future humanity that I want to announce that we just created the La Rouge Leg Legacy Foundation, whose aim is to publish the collected works of him and to create a renaissance of the studying of his ideas worldwide. I want to invite all of you to take an active part in this endeavor. Linda LaRouge was the most agapic person I have ever met. He was a man of providence because he lived his life in tune with history and the laws of the universe. He lives in the simultaneity of eternity. We are at a very precious moment in history, and it is full of incredible challenges. But the new paradigm, the vision of a completely new epoch of mankind, is already within reach. Let us be a decisive factor to bring it about. Let us fight this war for a beautiful future of humanity with a passionate love for mankind, as Lynn had it. He is not with us today in person, but his spirit is with us. And in this incredible moment, because an empire is collapsing, lashing out, rather destroying the world than allowing the new paradigm to emerge, but we believe in the innate goodness of man. And that, therefore, let's look at mankind, how it will be in 100 years from now. Let, let's look at mankind with the eyes of Linda LaRouche. And we will have fusion power, energy security, raw material security. We will have villages on the moon. We will have cities on Mars. And we will have established the shared community of future of mankind. Because all of us, uh, despite all of the unknowns of the very large universe, about two trillion galaxies have been discovered so far, mankind with that approach will be the immortal species. We are going to show now a video with Lyndon LaRouche.
The project to unify this that I've proposed, my wife has worked on, and others have worked on, is called the Eurasian Land Bridge Program. It's sometimes called the Silk Road Program. We developed this over a number of stages during the 1970s and 1980s. In 1989, we launched it in, in one form, my wife and I and several others, launched this package, which became first known as the European Productive Triangle. And then later, in 1992, my wife uh, negotiated or made discussions with people in China on this policy. And this was based on looking at some of the problems in the former Soviet Union and looking at China and saying, here is a common interest to develop the undeveloped and underutilized great area of Central Asia. It can only be done by this kind of method. And this is something which is in the common interest of China, of Europe, of the former Soviet Union, as well as the United States. So therefore, we should make this process, which connects the largest parts of the world population to industrial development, and takes the largest area of undeveloped area in, outside of Africa, and converts that into an area of growth, of global growth. Now, what's needed is several things changes. We need high-speed transportation. We're talking about thousands of miles. You're talking about the, the U.S. transcontinental railroad system, as it was understood by Lincoln, developed on a Eurasian scale, involving not a few million people, tens of millions of people, but we're talking about billions of people. We're talking about the greatest growth on this planet for the next century if we do it right. We're talking about something great. This means new transportation systems, such as high-speed magnetic levitation rail systems instead of, rails, instead of uh, uh, friction rail systems. This means tremendous amounts of power. We have it. High-temperature uh, nuclear reactors of a new type, the HTR type, which are being mass-produced or series-produced in China, and which can be series-produced in German design, can be series-produced in other countries. You can find the nuclear energy. We need vast water management. This area is technically water scarce. We can solve some of the problems by water management. We also are going to have to change the ecology of the planet. We're going to have to desalinate vast masses of seawater on coastal areas and save the upriver rainfall for the upriver needs. We're going to have to pipe, mine fresh water, mine from oceans, as well as manage from rivers, into areas which are deserts, like the great deserts of the Central Asia. We're going to have to tr do the same thing with Africa. And that's what's needed. These are great projects which, in terms of their economic impact, are equivalent to a mobilization for general warfare, and which have the economic benefits, which we are accustomed to having from technology, in other words, from large-scale mobilization for general warfare. We are going to have to transform, increase our own ability as machine tool powers. We're going to have to revolutionize our educational systems to become science oriented again. We're going to have to develop machine tool capabilities in countries that need it in partnership with us. Now there's going to be a need for food. There are various ways we can meet the needs for food in Asia. The great way to meet that need is Africa. Africa is the present greatest potential food grower on this planet. That is, it has the greatest area, which is designated operational agricultural land, which, if suitably developed, could very readily become a great surplus food producer. If you develop a transportation system of this type and link the so-called Silk Road or Land Bridge system through Egypt into a rail link in Africa, which we could build for them, we don't have to charge them anything. The benefits are so great, just give it to them. They don't have any money, so give it to them. Because the benefits, the payoff is tremendous. Once they have that kind of system, then the potential for the food growing potential of Africa becomes tremendous. And that becomes a basis for rebuilding Africa and giving it that initial start, that kick start it needs to enter efficiently and fully into modern society. So we have before us two alternatives. We have, on the one hand, the prospect, if we don't do what we have to do, of a new dark age descending upon all of mankind, a dark age whose best 
paradigm uh, for purposes of comparison is the dark age that struck Central Europe with the collapse of the Lombard banking system in the middle of the 14th century. And that can happen planet-wide, which would mean about two generations or so of new dark age throughout this planet, with the world's population perhaps collapsing to levels of the several hundred million, which is world population level during the 14th century. That's a likely prospect. On the other hand, we have, if we cooperate with these countries of Asia to create a just new world economic order on the ruins of a bankrupt system and engage in great enterprises of the type which we've conducted before to develop Eurasia and to bring justice to Africa at last, if we do these things, then the 20th century can be the brightest century of human existence. Because by these means, by bringing people to this process, we have the opportunity to establish as universal a principle which is universal. The principle that all persons, man and woman, are each made in the image of God and must be afforded a condition of life in society, an opportunity which is consistent with a being of such qualities. And to develop and perfect our political systems to bring them into accord with that objective. This next century can be the most glorious in the existence of mankind to date, or it can be the most awful. The decision lies now with us in 1988. Can we summon the leaders and the leadership to do what many people still at this moment would consider unthinkable? To, to maximize the risk rather than spreading and minimizing it and by maximizing the risk as the great commanders in warfare to win the war, whereas those who minimize the risk are sure to lose it. Thank you. So I call our next speaker. One way down. Je me suis off English, hein? Dear Mrs. Zeblerouche, ladies and gentlemen, good day. First, I would like to thank Mrs. Zeblerouche for her invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to exchange ideas with today's guests from many countries about the Belt and Road Initiative. The term Silk Road is inextricably linked with Germany. It was invented in 1877 by the German geographer Ferdinand von Richthofen and has since become common knowledge. But the development of the Silk Road goes back to more than 2,100 years ago. During the Han Dynasty, Chinese official Zhang Qian was sent to Central Asia twice, and he thus opened the door to friendly relations between China and the Central Asian countries. At the same time, he opened a cross connection from east to west, which linked up the trade routes to Europe as the Silk Road. Chinese goods such as silk, porcelain, and tea flowed through that road into all parts of the world, while Confucianism and Chinese culture were spread throughout the Silk Road. This was a major chapter in the history of exchanges between East and West, East and West. Today, 2,100 years later, we find ourselves in an era of constant challenges and growing risks. Unilateralism and protectionism threatens seriously peace and stability in the world. And no single country can be spared. 
the right solution to that is to set into motion interregional cooperation of even greater magnitude at even higher and more numerous levels. When President Xi Jinping proposed in 2013 the initiative of international cooperation to build the New Silk Road, his aim was to enhance connectivity and deepen pragmatic cooperation so as to meet the risks and challenges of mankind hand in hand and to promote common development for mutual de benefit. So how successful has the Belt and Road Initiative been in these first six years? Well, the project has increasingly gained in international support and approval. So far, more than 160 countries and international organizations have signed 195 agreements, government agreements, with China. The United Nations, the G20, and APEC have already included the BRI as in its key points in their final documents. <coughs> in these six years, <coughs> there have been uh, more than $6 trillion in trade with countries in the BRI and more than $990 billion in direct investments into the countries concerned. And many cooperations have been set up locally at the same time. So with that, the BRI has provided a new, a new platform for international trade and investment and created new leeway for the growth of the global economy. In these six years, China, together with the participating countries, has founded 82 industrial parks, and they have brought the host countries more than $2 billion in tax revenue and created about 300,000 jobs. That cooperation has uh, improved the living conditions of the local populations and created a better business climate and more and more development opportunities. According to a World Bank report, once all the transportation projects of the BRI have been completed, trade should increase by 2.8 to 9.7 percent, and uh, 7.6 million people will have been freed from extreme poverty. So these accomplishments show clearly that although the BRI began in China, its positive effects have radiated throughout the whole world. Now, as concerns the cooperation between China and Germany, both countries have already reaped tremendous benefits from their first early successes. In spite of criticism from uh, government circles and from the EU, they have, there has, they have been very well received by other uh, countries. Now, if you consider the uh, city of Duisburg, for example, the port was in a severe crisis when China first arrived, or when Xi Jinping first arrived here. But in the meantime, uh, it's gone from place 93 uh, some years ago to place 33 this year. And about 3,000 new jobs were created in the port of Duisburg. And in Piraeus, Piraeus the port has, is the largest in the Mediterranean region. And it's become the largest for container uh, traffic. And it looks very promising for the future. 
Now, as concerns uh, China and, uh, and Germany, they have, uh, as I said, had much success in the beginning. Now, the rail link between China and Europe is the most effective project, we can say, in that respect. The time for shipment has decreased by about 30 percent compared to ship, and it, the costs are only one-fifth of what air freight costs. So the benefits are obvious. As of today, more than 17,000 trains have run on the line, and including 40 percent between China and Germany. The connections pass through more than 50 cities and 15 countries and ensure a balanced utilization in both directions. Now, if we look at the city of Duisburg, since uh, Xi Jinping made a, paid a visit there in March 2014, the rail traffic has increased uh, between China and Europe. And it has also favored investments by Chinese companies so that the number of companies, Chinese companies in Duisburg today has gone from 40 to over 100. In the logistics branch alone, around 3,000 new jobs were created. Another very important hub of the BRA is the city of Hamburg. And we could say that the rail transport between China and Europe has become the longest connection of cooperation on the Eurasian continent. And it's given new impulse to regional economic growth. Ladies and gentlemen, this year we have the 70th, 70th anniversary of the founding of the new China and the diplomatic relations between China and Germany were established 47 years ago. Under the motto, Cooperation for Mutual Benefit, relations between China and Germany are being further developed and have re reached an unprecedented breadth, depth, and intensity. Bilateral relations in the economy and trade have steadily grown. Germany has maintained its position for more than 30, 43 years now as China's largest trading partner in Europe, while China has become Germany's largest trading partner worldwide. And ever since China introduced a new series of reform and opening up, uh, German companies like BASF, BMW, and Allianz have been among the prime beneficiaries. Now, looking to the future, one might ask, what are the opportunities uh, for both countries, China and Germany, from the new Silk Road? Now, in April of this year, President Xi set out his ideas uh, at the um, second international summit of the BRI. He presented his ideas for high-quality joint expansion of the New Silk Road. In May, when Chancellor Merkel visited the port of Hamburg, she strongly stated the obvious benefits of the BRI for the development of, of Hamburg and its port. The German Chamber of Commerce and Industry has listed the BRI as a priority, and it promotes uh, works toward a better understanding of the huge opportunities for German companies. Over the past year, I, for example, have often received inquiries or invitations to events about the new Silk Road. So the interest is constantly on the rise. If we look to the third decade of the 21st century, uh, the BRI will enter into a third phase, a new phase, 
in which China and Germany or Europe will be able to further expand their cooperation. First of all, that means to help define the rules. Germany is a founding member of the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank, the fourth largest shareholder, and the largest non-regional investor. Uh, in the framework of the AIIB, Sino-German cooperation as jointly uh, financed projects has proven to be extremely fruitful. So Europe, including Germany, is one of the lead, leading voices and forces in establishing rules and standards for the cooperation. So they have steadily improved, and they will continue to do so in the future. And Germany will, of course, be invited to take part and to make a contribution. Secondly, it means opening new markets, third markets. Many German companies have already begun to capitalize on cooperation with third countries. For example, Siemens, Siemens and Voigt have opened overseas markets together with more than 100 Chinese companies. The port of Duisburg is actively involved in uh, setting up an industrial park, sino belarusian industrial park, and is negotiating greater logistical cooperation with Chinese uh, companies. Working together in third markets is a model for the kind of international cooperation characterized by openness, tolerance, pragmatism, and effectiveness. It embodies, in fact, the golden rule of the BRI, which is be part of the discussion, be part of the design, and the benefits. And moreover, it helps the parties involved to unleash new driving forces through the effects of synergy and to gain mutual advantages according to the formula 1 plus 1 plus 1 is greater than 3. <coughs> Thirdly, it means promoting environmental development. We used to always pollute first and repair the damage afterwards. In the wake of economic development, however, China no longer wants to uh, stick to that old way of doing. Therefore, in developing the new Silk Road, the utmost importance is given to ecological compatibility and environmental protection. The idea is to build a green Silk Road. And we will continue to adhere to the concepts of openness, ecology, and honesty. And in view of the next phase, uh, we have introduced a series of measures in, for financing anti-corruption and environmental production. Uh, the German side is, of course, invited to join in and to bring its rich experience to this. The world is now at a crossroads, and it must make a choice. Do we want walls or bridges? Multilateralism or unilateralism? The joint development of a new Silk Road is there to support an open global economy and worldwide partnerships. But despite the great interest uh, economically, <coughs> the official position of the EU and some Western European governments reserved, remains reserved, if not negative. The mainstream media and the so-called think tanks always consider the initiative critically and are often full of fake news. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Nonetheless, we hope that more countries and companies In conclusion, ein tiefgreifendes Verständnis für die Bedeutung der BRI-Initiative für die globale Kooperation für die Zukunft der Menschheit bzw. aus verschiedenen Wirtschafts-, Kultur- und Globalisierungsperspektiven, sondern nicht wie die anderen Kriterien die Initiative immer und immer und häufig nur aus geopolitischen oder ideologischen Kalkül. Andererseits haben Sie für die Gäste aus verschiedenen Ländern eine gute Plattform zum Austauschen und der Dialog angeboten. Dafür geht Finally, I wish all the best to the present friends. Thank you, Minister Councillor Wang Weidong. Now I'm calling our dear friend Natalia Vitrenko. Уважаемые делегаты конференции, будущее человечества. Дорогие делегаты, so dear um, delegates and dear Helga, Seplarush, and um, it's a great honor for me to speak to this conference about the role of LaRouche's uh, teachings for solving the problems of the world as a whole and particular continents, Eurasia, or uh, specific countries like Ukraine. This is my first address to a Schiller Institute, con uh, uh, Institute conference uh, since the death of the patriot of planet Earth, outstanding person, the world renowned economist, philosopher, and political and public figure, Lyndon LaRouche. I am proud that for nearly a quarter of a century, in various forms, I was able to listen to the great LaRouche, to see him at conferences where uh, we could discuss social, economic, and geopolitical processes, as well as to spend time at the home of Lynn and Helga, um, a family living at a very high intellectual level. I am grateful that I was able not to only be acquainted, but to be friends with these unique people. Uh, the great Lynn has left us. But his teachings, the powerful light of his ideas, remain. Likewise, the planet Earth still has problems, and uh, these problems are growing in an ominous uh, way to an explosive level, and Lyndon LaRouche has forecasted and warned about this. In particular, at the Forum for the Unity of Europe, How to Restore Trust, which was organized in January 2019 in Moscow by the International Slavic um, Academy of Sciences, Education, Arts and Culture. In my lecture, Towards a United Europe Through a Paradigm Shift, in the search for solutions to problems of modern Europe, I utilized the ideas of Nicolas of Cusa and Vladimir Vernadsky and Lyndon LaRouche, which is published in the journal The Slavs, um, this year, um, and uh, the analytical mythology methodology is um, extraordinarily important because it is scientific and has been confirmed in practice. I do not know of any other scholar in the world who could forecast financial crisis as precisely as Lynn did, both in the world economy as a whole and in individual countries. I believe that the works of Lyndon LaRouche on the methodology of economic studies, as well as his specific proposals for changing the nature and the role of the international institutions that determine the existing world order, and his proposals for reorganizing the world and creating an entirely different world order should be a separate subject for study by students at all leading universities in the world.
The precision of LaRouche's forecasts and his meticulous treatment of the problems of national economies are clearly demonstrated in the case of my country, Ukraine. Ukraine was one of the most advanced republics of the former Soviet Union. Recently, just in uh, 1991, it was a prosperous and progressively developing country. The Ukrainian Soviet Socialist uh, Republic uh, was among the top 10 countries of the world and had a GDP that was greater than Portugal, um, uh, Argentina, Poland, and Ukraine was among the top six, I repeat this, six countries in the world possessing full cycle production capacities for making aircraft and had highly advanced modern shipbuilding, diesel engine building, automobile, automobile um, including buses and missiles and agricultural um, impl uh, implemented um, industries. We had no unemployment. We had uh, skill training growth and labor force uh, growth. And in June 1992, Ukraine joined the International Monetary Fund and agreed to implement all the conditionalities dictated by the IMF for credits that were issued. And Vladimir Marchenko and myself um, arrived to the Schiller Institute conference in Washington in February 1995 and reported that a discussion was underway in Ukraine about a government reform uh, program which the uh, parliament was to uh, approve. And Lynn and, Helga, uh, Lynn and Helga were not indifferent uh, to the inevitable catastrophe facing our country. And at that time, uh, we represented the Socialist Party of uh, Ukraine, SPU, and Alexander Moroz, its leader, was Speaker of the Parliament. and. Um, our socialist fraction and him personally determined the reforms uh, in Ukraine, especially insofar as Ukrainian economists and economic managers were torpedoing the IMF's uh, monetarist colonial uh, prescriptions within the country, especially supporting LaRouche's theory of physical economy and advocating a policy under which the development of material production would be decisive. First, the Schiller Institute sent its representatives, uh, Michael Witt and Dennis Small, to Ukraine. And I'm very happy to see Dennis Small 24 years later after that uh, first meeting of ours. And in May uh, 1995, um, Dennis Small and Michael Witt uh, met uh, the, the party activists of uh, Ukraine, uh, the uh, SPU. And uh, in June 1995, Lyndon and Helga were in Kiev where a meeting was arranged between them and the Speaker of the Parliament. And as a participant of that meeting, I witnessed how convincingly and in what a well-argued fashion LaRouche urged Moroz not to accept the IMF loans and to refrain from implementing reforms according to the IMF uh, recipes. Unfortunately, Moroz's uh, moral qualities and intellectual level uh, prevented him from taking the advice of the great American economist and scientist um, and um, uh, this, uh, just as, as uh, LaRouche has warned, the, Ukra the Ukrainian catastrophe became irreversible, even though we had a chance, a real historical chance, to prevent this terrible destruction of the economy and the impoverishment and dying out of the population. Unfortunately, the inability to realize the magnitude of the threats and to choose a pathway of national salvation is not just a, a problem to Moroz and the Ukrainian political elite. It's a problem of the political elites in practically every country in the world, with the exception, exception of China. As a result, because of their failure to understand fundamental socio-economic and financial processes and to take responsibility for the fate of their populations, not only their own countries suffer, but the whole world suffers. This challenge is now at the top of the world's agenda. What LaRouche tirelessly talked about, the inevitability of the global financial crisis comparable in its effects to thermonuclear war, stemming from the inflation of gigantic financial speculative bubbles to a critical size, 
is now being talked about by experts on every continent. Paul Krugman and Mark Mobius, George Soros and Mervyn King and uh, the analysts of the, England, uh, the Bank of England, the World Bank, Bank of America, among many others. The enormous financial debt of not only the weak countries of the third world, but also the leading economies of the planet, which is the most important thing, is turning the world economy into a, a powder keg, which inevitably will explode in the near future. According to data from the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, uh, the American debt in, that, in 2019 uh, was $23 trillion, which is 135% of their GDP. Japan has a debt of $13 trillion, which is 295% of their GDP, and UK has a $2.7 trillion, trillion debt, uh, while the World Bank stated that the maximum permissible debt level for a country was 77% of GDP. But let us return to Ukraine. Ukraine fully implemented all of the IMF's demands. The state sector of the economy was dismantled with mass privatization, and the National Bank was no longer subordinated to the government, and the system of commercial banks was established within uh, which the smallest banks are regularly shut down. Simultaneously, we had the deregulation of prices, the currency exchange rate and foreign trade, and all conditions were created uh, for the for formation and enrichment of a Ukrainian oligarchy. Another boost to their capital was the cheap uh, labor model imposed by the West, based on an artificial understatement of the official minimum substance level of income which was set at only 20 to 25 percent of the real cost of living, which in turn led to meager wage and pension levels and pitifully low social benefits. Macroeconomic stability was evaluated exclusively by the reduction of the budget deficit through cuts in funding for health care and education and for culture and sports and through constant increases in utility races justified by the mantra that they needed to be raised to market level and that the government should be removed from any regulation of prices in food, medicine, and vital necessities. And um, all of this led to um, uh, a constant under-strained rise of the cost of living. And the great majority of the population was deprived of the ability to cover the cost of living with their income. So it is no surprise that Ukraine ranks last out of all 42 European countries in purchasing power of the population. These statistics were published in October 2019 in the study Purchasing Power Europe 2019 by the data analysis company JFK. Uh, on average, uh, the uh, GFK, an uh, income of a resident of Europe in 2019 is 14,739 euros, while the average Ukrainian has an income of eight, uh, eight times less. And um, Ukraine's economic policy is determined by the shared interests of the Ukrainian oligarchs and the international financial institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, the uh, European uh, Bank of Reconstruction and Development, the World Trade Organization, and others, which in turn expresses the interests of the ruling circles in the leading um, countries of the West. They don't need Ukraine as a competitor or an equal partner. LaRouche has warned they have no interest in the development of the national economy or its very basis physical economy and material production they are interested in having a large market for their goods and services so as to increase their own profits they need ukraine as a supplier of raw materials for their companies and of super cheap highly skilled labor the plans of the west also include taking over ukraine's very territory Remember that this is a country in the geo uh, geographical center of Europe, an important transit juncture um, for the cont continent of Eurasia, with outlets to two seas and a great number of rivers, lakes, and large forest, um, forest areas. Of particular importance is our wealth of arable land, 19% of all the farmland of Europe, and black earth. 8.7% um, uh, of the world's black earth, black earth soil. Therefore, 
the Western um, orchestrators of the reforms in Ukraine, along with the Ukrainian oligarchs, are absolutely indifferent to the suffering of our people, uh, which led uh, to a horrific scale of labor immigration from Ukraine. At least 10 million people over the past five years have left the country, and negative natural population growth, the death rate is almost double the birth rate. The outcome is that the population of Ukraine has fallen from 52 million people at the time of uh, independence in uh, 1991 to 30 million people. Experts have been raising the alarm for a long time, and that is their estimate of the real population of the country. But government statistics continue to cover it up, stating that the population is 42 million, not counting Crimea or the self-proclaimed Donbass republics. And the current speaker of the parliament, um, Dmitry Razumkov, however, had to acknowledge the uh, real state of affairs where he argued in September uh, 2019 in favor of amending the constitution of Ukraine to reduce the number of people's uh, deputies in the parliament from uh, 450 to 300. And uh, today, the Ukrainian uh, economy is a sorry spectacle. Uh, the GDP uh, uh, in uh, uh, 2018 was at only two-thirds the level of 1991. <laughs> and um, Ukraine's GDP was one-sixth uh, that of Argentina, one-fifth of um, the uh, G GDP of Poland, and half that of Portugal. And according to IMF uh, figures uh, for uh, 2018, average GDP per capita worldwide was um, uh, $11,730. While in advanced countries, in developed countries, it is um, 48970 uh, uh, dollars and um, thousand dollars, and in the de developing countries, uh, it, it is um, five thousand four hundred ninety dollars, and in Ukraine, it was. Uh, only 2,820, which is two times lower than the uh, than in, in in the developing countries. So, uh, GDP is a monetary category, and uh, what is hidden behind all of this? How much uh, precisely what, uh, and what do goods did the country produce in this time period? Um, having obeyed the IMF and uh, getting uh, approval from the U USA. Um, uh, of its actions, Ukraine actually experienced a total economic catastrophe. Let's look at uh, picture one, illustration one. This first graph uh, shows, we need graph one, that shows the decline of Ukraine's share in world population, um, in world, in world production of the most important raw materials for the metallurgical industries. With the exception of uh, rutile concentrate, production of all other components collapsed very deeply. The red bar uh, shows uh, the share of world population in 1992, and the blue bar is for uh, 2018. So, so did output of uh, pig, iron, and steel. And um, over the past uh, five years, uh, from 2013 to 2018, steel output uh, fell by nearly one third from uh, 30.6 million tons in uh, 2014 to 21.1 million tons in 2018. Pig iron fell by 20% from 25 million tons in uh, 2013 to 20.5 million tons in uh, 2018. Yet this is strategically important uh, a sector for Ukraine. Steel and other metallurgy, uh, metallurgy companies uh, account for 30% of Ukraine's total industrial production and 25% of our exports. And the second graph shows uh, the condition of Ukraine's industry with rising uh, indexes um, starting back in uh, January of 2010. And it is clear that the industry is uh, comatose. Is It's disappearing from our country that used to be an industrial power. Industry's share in Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's GDP has fallen by more than one half from uh, the 44% of 1991 to the 20% of 2018, while the share of machine building and industrial output also declined by nearly one half. And uh, from 
uh, 31% in 1991 to 15% in 2018 and this share of uh, the share of in innovation based products sold within total industrial production has fallen by a factor of 13 just since uh, the beginning of this century uh, from 9.4% in 2000 in the year 2000 to 0.7% um, in 2017 and um the index uh, of industrial production in January and August uh, 2019 is um, this is our um, uh, current year. All of the uh, industrial production as a whole is continuing to collapse. Over the past eight months, has fallen by nine percent, and uh, the overall amount uh, of uh, decline happens in machine building and energy sector. With over past five years, we have seen a one-fourth decline uh, from uh, the 200 billion kilowatt uh, hours in 2013 to 150 billion kilowatt hours in 2018. I will give you another couple of figures from machine building. In 1991, our leading aircraft manufacturer Antonov produced 250 airplanes, but this year, in, nine, in 2019, they have not produced a single airplane. Ten years ago, a Ukraine managed to produce uh, 423,000 automobiles, but a decade later now, the number is only uh, it's like 50, 50 times less. Uh, the figure is 8,000 point six hundred and um, other figures also the number of cattle has fallen from 25.2 million head heads in uh, 1992 3.7 million in 2019 only one seventh of the previous herd and nobody takes respons responsibility for this catastrophe larouche stood up precisely against the destruction of the physical economy that is why he advocated building transport corridors of development from the atlantic to the pacific and indian oceans and put forward head-spinning ideas about developing the moon and making flights to Mars. What for? Uh, for advanced te technologies to develop more rapidly and pr productive capital to dominate rather than speculative capital and the activity of the banking sector would be reorganized accordingly. The state would invest in the development of infrastructure, creating the needed conditions for the development of the power industry, transport, industrial production. In other words, the state would be responsible for the development of physical economy as the basis of the entire economic system. Lyndon LaRouche, as an outstanding economist, philosopher, and politician, drew our attention not only to the causes on the scale of the economic upheavals, but also to the political consequences of the destruction of the existing monetary system. He warned that the oligarchy would call for a policy of strict austerity and would establish fascist dictatorships. Therefore, it was essential that progressive humanity defeat the oligarchy and free ourselves once and for all from that parasitical system. And now all mankind has seen the rebirth of fascism and Nazism in Ukraine. I spoke about this openly at my press conference in the European Parliament on February 26 in 2014, immediately after the coup d'etat in Ukraine in Kiev. Once again, I want to thank our co-thinkers from the Schiller Institute, both uh, the, those ma many of you are here today, uh, both for organizing our trip to Europe at that time and for organizing that press, press conference. The further development of events completely confirmed our assessment. He, and uh, it was the Nazi Russophobic coloration of the Euromaidan that led to the loss of Crimea and set the stage for the fighting in Slavyansk and the monstrous attack on the anti-fascists in the Odessa House of Trade Unions and brought on the fratricidal um, fr 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 war in the Donbass. Uh, this was a war that continued for five and a half years and uh, took the lives of uh, uh, over 13,000 lives, and including civilians, um, women, old people, children. Hundreds of thousands have been wounded or psychologically traumatized. Ukraine 
is afflicted by the Nazi militants. They are armed, well-trained, and well-funded. They carry out acts of intimidation, raid the seizures of premises all over Ukraine. Under Ukraine's new President Zelensky, they are holding the entire population in fear, terrorizing the entire country. Instead of rooting out Nazis and banning all Nazi parties and movements, the Ukrainian government has, to the contrary, made a Nazi ideological, uh, ideology official and is fighting against leftist parties and anti-fascist organizations. 6,000 of our com compatriots are in prison as dissidents. And uh, the perse persecution of our um, progressive socialist party in Ukraine is um, uh, we, we are seen as an opposition, opposition party, and our party headquarters and the editorial offices of our party newspaper have been seized three years ago and have not been returned to us. Law enforcement agencies refuse to investigate the attacks by the Nazis against the leaders of our party and on party demonstrations, and those responsible have never been brought to justice. And the Ministry of Justice of Ukraine has blocked the operations of our party by not officially registering the documents of now five or, uh, of our congresses, while court decisions in our favor have been uh, met with uh, defiance and simply not implemented. And throughout the years since the coup in 2014, we have done everything in our power to bring the truth about Ukraine to the world. But there has not been any proper reaction on the part of the international community. And this cannot continue you forever. Now, at last, Europe is beginning to sound an alarm. One year ago, in October, October 25th, 2018, the European Parliament passed a resolution titled on the rise of neo-fascist violence in Europe, in which they were forced to observe that openly neo-fascist, neo-Nazi, racist and xenophobic groups and political parties are inciting hatred and violence in society reminding us of what they were capable of in the past. At that time, the European Parliament adopted sweeping recommendations to the nations of Europe. I will cite two of the 32 of this res points of this resolution. Point nine, calls on the member states to strongly condemn and sanction hate crime, hate speech and scapegoating by politicians and public officials at all levels and all types of media as they directly normalize and reinforce hatreds and violence in society. And point 12, calls on the member states to investigate and prosecute hate crimes and to share best practices for identifying and investigating hate crimes, including those motivated specifically by the various forms of xenophobia. As we can see, LaRouche was right in this regard too. The IMF economic reforms, which destroyed material production or the physical economy, led to a political coup and to Nazism, and to fascism. Of course, all possible approaches in the world's entire experience must be employed to defend mankind, uh, the population of Ukraine included, from Nazism, fascism, and xenophobia. Without this, the world cannot be saved or transformed. Lyndon LaRouche gave us the knowledge which we are obliged to use for the salvation of humanity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Natalia Vitrenko. Now I'm calling Professor Andrei Ostrovsky to come to the volume. Thank you very much. I'd like to express my deep gratitude to Mademoiselle Madame LaRouche to invite me to take part in this conference that's devoted to late scholar, uh, very <coughs> famous scholar, uh, Lyndon LaRouche. And uh, now we just listened to a few reports concerning his learnings, especially his predictions about transport infrastructure via U through Europe. That's one way, one belt, one road. China just 
in 1913, the, uh, people, the chairman Xi Jinping uh, at the summit with the president of Kazakhstan, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, declared the beginning of initiative economic belt of the Silk Road. This project consists of two parts, a continental belt via Kazakhstan and Russia to Europe, or via the Mediterranean Sea and the Sea Belt via Southeast Asia. Later, these projects were called as initiative One Belt, One Road. In the beginning of 2015, President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, declared uh, founding Eurasian Economic Union, where there are five members, Russian Federation, Kazakhstan, Belarus, Armenia, and Kyr Kyrgyzstan. Uh, there was a proposal to establish a free trade zone, Eurasia Economic Union and China, but in May 2015, by the decision of the European uh, Economic Union and China's leadership, the Russian Federation of the People's Republic of China made a joint man statement about mutual cooperation for conjunction of two projects, uh, Eurasian Economic Union and Economic Belt of the Silk Road. Uh, China's project, Economic Belt of the Silk Road, has evident advantages in comparison with Russia's project, Eurasian Economic Union, because of his uh, ancient basis, uh, more than 2,100 uh, 2, years. Both projects have common and non-contradictory cultural standards. Project Economic Belt of the Silk Road includes a population of more than 3 billion people, and Project Eurasian Economic Union only about 200 million people. In March uh, 2015, the Ministry of Commerce and uh, the State Committee of National Development and Reform of the People's Republic of China published a joint document where it was stated, on the one hand, developing economies of East Asian countries, on the other hand, developed economies of Eurasian European countries, and between them there are countries with vast, vast space of lands with big potential of economic development. For China, the project Economic Belt of the Silk Road gives vent to rapid development of its western areas, I mean three provinces, Shanxi, Gansu, Xinhai, and two autonomous regions, Ninxiahu and Xinjiang Uyghur, which are behind coastal areas by the GDP volume and growth rates. This project will promote even distribution resources and industries all over the territory of China uh, for achievement of high social and economic results. Economic Belt of the Silk Road project became a part of China's 13th five-year plan, 2016-2020, that was adopted at the session of the National People's Congress in March 2016. This project should be fulfilled within 30 years. It will include seven belts, transport, energy, trade, information, scientific and technical, agricultural and tourist belts. In March 2015, at the Asian Economic Forum, Russian Vice Premier at that time, Vigor Shuvalov, declared the decision of Russia to take part in the strategy of economic belt of the Silk Road. Free movement of goods and capitals within the Eurasian Economic Union is bringing together European and Asian economies that has in common with the Chinese initiative, Economic Belt of the Silk Road. In Russia, we are sure that joint work on two projects, Economic Belt of the Silk Road and Eurasian Economic Union, could create new possibilities for the development of China and countries of Eurasian Economic Union. On the territory of the countries of Eurasian Economic Union, Russia, Kazakhstan, and Belarus, growth rates of economy could be, developed, uh, could be developed rapidly in the zone of transport infrastructure, construction, railroads, and highways by route from Druzhba, via Mos Kazan, Moscow, Minsk, and it had been developing in the zones of Trans-Siberia Railroad and Chinese East Railroad in the end of the 19th the beginning of the 20th century. The conjunction of two large-scale projects, on the one hand, helps Russia and other countries of Eurasian Economic Union to create a huge transit zone for goods from Europe to Asia, to develop a market for produced goods both in China and in Asian countries. On the other hand, China will have more possibilities for developing its sales market and raw materials markets. The conjunction of these two projects 
uh, could also help to develop trade and economic cooperation between countries of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. The north route of economic belt of the Silk Road passes through the territory of three main countries of the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, Russia, China, and Kazakhstan. After developing the project, the route of economic belt of the Silk Road will pass from China through Central and Western Asia to the Persian Bay and the Mediterranean Sea, and it can help to improve, to involve in this sphere of the project, not only countries of the C uh, SCO, but a number of neighborhood countries of Central and, and Western Asia as a result of mutually beneficial cooperation. The next stage of the conjunction of two projects is decreasing and then eliminating trade and investment barriers between members of economic belt of the Silk Road. It's necessary for increasing their trade and investment potential, speeding up capital movement within economic system, harmonization of currency systems. It could bring to the situation when countries, members of economic belt of the Silk Road would refuse to use dollars in the accounts between them. For conjunction of the two projects, economic belt of the Silk Road and Eurasian Economic Union, it's necessary to use opportunities of new financial structures, Asian Bank of Infrastructure of Infrastructure Investment, ABII, and Silk Road Foundation. As the fulfillment of this task is quite possible on the base of the Asian Bank of Infrastructure Investments with $100 billion of fixed assets and Silk Road Foundation with $40 billion of fixed assets. It helps to provide for the development of the project Economic Belt of the Silk Road on the basis of financial strengths of China, its large amount of gold and hard currency reserves, a huge transit zone between the People's Republic of China and the Eurasian Union. In April 2019, the second international forum on initiative One Belt, One Road took place in Beijing. About 40 leaders of the countries along the route, One Belt, One Road, and more than 1,000 experts and journalists took part in this forum. The people, the PRC chairman, Xi Jinping, made a principal speech. More than 140 cooperation agreements were signed, and the volume of Chinese investments in the project along the route of initiative One Belt, One Road was more than $80 billion, and the volume of tax and other kinds of payments exceeded $2 billion U.S. dollars. Now, China is opt optimal foreign partner for solving by Russia a strategic task of developing Siberia and the Far East. Please, uh, may I have a map? Just, uh, just first of all, the orientation uh, to Chinese market can help economically effective exploration of national resources in these territories, which demands large investments and long period of time. Second, the development of Siberia and the Far East is in line with China's interests because it helps solving the task of the revival of all industrial base of the Northeast China in neighboring regions with Russia and providing Chinese economy with necessary resources in general. Third, the development of Sino-Russian foreign trade could stimulate economic relations of Russia with uh, Japan and the Republic of Korea. Russia takes an important place in foreign economic strategy of Beijing uh, as a supplier of raw materials and energy resources and the market for Chinese machinery production and electronics. In future, Russia is to take a leading position in supply of natural gas to China after putting into operation gas pipeline strengths of Siberia from Chayanda gas deposits to the northeast China. Gas pipeline capacity 55 square cubic meters, uh, billion square cubic meters per year. Nowadays, the most part of crude oil and natural gas supply to the People's Republic of China is carried out from Arabic countries to several African countries by sea through narrow Strait of Malacca in the Southeast Asia, which could be blocked in emergency situation. That's why China is interested in alternative routes for energy resources and other goods supply from Russia and Central Asia countries by land and from Latin America through the, through the Pacific Ocean. 
The Far Eastern Federal District has occupies 36 percent of the territory of Russia. It has only 5 percent of the Russian population, uh, Russian Federation population, but 30 percent of Russian reserves of coal, 20 percent of hydrocarbons, 25 percent of timber, and large reserves of rare and non ferro metals. But the Far East infrastructure is underdeveloped. There is the only motor road from Irkutsk to Vladivostok. There are only two railways, Transib and BAM, bam baikal Amor mm, Railway, which is underloaded because of economic backwardness of the regions with high reserves of natural resources and direct exit to deep water ports South Gavani. Uh, the Far East and the most part of Siberia are separated from the European part of Russia. Besides, we should add high transport tariffs, which increase an economic gap between the Far East regions and the European part of Russia. Now, the development of Siberia and the Far East is one of the most difficult strategic problems of regional development in Russia. But it becomes evident that for the Russian Far East building the gross poles, increasing population, it's necessary to develop mutual cooperation with the states uh, of the Asian Pacific region for the establishment of joint ventures. The growth of joint ventures volumes in the uh, uh, GRP, the growth of the GRP per capita, gross regional product, I mean, per capita, and on this basis to increase solvent population demand and to develop retail trade and service volumes. Russia could achieve these goals only by active regional economic cooperation and Russia's inclusion into integration processes in the Asia-Pacific region. The participation of the Russian Far East and Siberia in initiative One Belt, One Road is one of the important forms of inter-regional cooperation in the Asia-Pacific region. There are three routes to the West. The first via Kazakhstan, the Caspian Sea, Transcaucasian regions, and Turkey. The second via Kazakhstan and European part of Russia. The third via Iran and Syria. But there are a lot of Silk Road variants, beginning from economic belt of the Silk Road, Sichol Jelu or Ita Ilu, and maritime Silk Road, High Silu, and finishing different sea and railroad routes of Eurasia. There are three traditional routes through European uh, part of Russia, Kazakhstan, Turkey, Iran, Georgia, and Azerbaijan. And there is an extra route via West Siberia, East Siberia, and the Far East. There are plans to build two transcontinental bridges, Europe, Asia, Northern and Southern, but the route Yekaterinburg Novosibirsk, Krasnoyarsk, Irkutsk, Chita, Khabarovsk, Vladivostok will become an important part of northern uh, transcontinental bridge. In the beginning of the 21st century, the authors of the analytical report for the Russian Federation, Federal Council of the Federal Assembly, Irkutsk, September uh, 2000, determined four main directions for Russia's integration into Northeast Asia. First, development of crude oil and natural gas resources of the Russian uh, Far East and Siberia, and building oil and gas pipelines network and electric transmission lines, which could be a basis for economic integration. Second, utilization of Russia's geographical position as a bridge between Europe and Asia. Third, attraction of foreign labor force for development of Russian Far East, of the Russian Far East and Siberia. And fourth, the establishment of technological parks on the basis of Russian scientific potential. All these directions of Russian integration into Northeast Asia are of great importance. But we should pay attention at the point concerning the utilization of Russia's geographical position as a bridge between Europe and Asia. For regu regular work of the bridge, it's necessary to use sea components, seaports with a large volume of uh, freight turnover which could handle all can vessel, ocean vessels with large volumes of cargo in containers. Now, there are a lot of seaports in the Far East, but the most part of them are frozen in winter. There are only th uh, three seaports in the Far East, Vladivostok, 
Nahotka and Zarubino, where ice conditions are more or less favorable. It's necessary to compare possibilities of the three seaports of the Far East. Port Nahotka is a basis, basic trade port on the south of uh, the Primorsky Krai, but its main shortcoming is bad transport accessibility, which creates extra difficulties for cargo transportation from the port and limits its freight turnover. Port Zarubino is more preferable by its climate and natural conditions but its undeveloped infrastructure on the adjacent territories limits its development perspectives. The authorities of Dilin province feel inclined to use the port as an outlet to the sea, but there are a lot of economic and political obstacles on the way of its realization. The most preferable way, version is uh, the development of Port Vladivostok, because its geographical position is the most advantageous. Vladivostok, in contrast to Nahotka, has more preferable geographic position because of more developed infrastructure. There are railway and motorway, airport, and better connectivity of transport network in comparison with Nahotka and Zarubina. The forest development needs large-scale infrastructural projects, which demand large investments. State budget investments or foreign investments in the frame of state-private partnership programs could be main sources of financing. That's why we may consider cooperation with Asia Pacific region countries as a real tool of complex development in the regional economy. It's important to determine several aspects of Sino Russian trade and economic cooperation, which have large influence on integration process in Northeast Asia. The growth of Sino Russian trade and investment mutual cooperation promote China's economic development and help China. Uh, to keep high growth rates based on the Russian natural resources. And the economic development of the Russian Far East and Siberia could be more dynamic because of more developed infrastructure network. There are four perspective directions of Sino-Russian mutual cooperation for the conjunction of the two projects, One Belt, One Road and Eurasian Economic Union. First, energy resources. Second, transport. Third, investment and force banking. The growth of Sino-Russian trade and economic relations now depends on trade exchange. For better development of Sino-Russian trade, it's necessary to pay attention to four above-mentioned directions of Sino-Russian mutual cooperation. It could become a key link for the development of integration process in Northeast Asia and narrow the gap in the economic potential between Asian and European part of Russia. Russia should make actively take part in Chinese initiative One Belt, One Road in order to achieve the goal of the Russian Far East development. Thank you very much for listening to my report. Thank you very much, Professor Ostrovsky. Before I call the next speaker, I have to make a change in the program. We need this morning a question and answer. So, Professor Enzo Siviero is going to speak, is going to speak next, but uh, the two last speakers are going to speak at the beginning of this afternoon, and then we will proceed with our second panel. So, uh, Leonidas Christantopoulos and uh, Anna Corvez are going to speak this afternoon. After the speech, there will be a short new question and answer. I pledge that. And then we will proceed with the second panel. So now I call Professor Siviero to come, and he will be the last speaker this morning. And then we will have a, all, about half an hour question and answer period this morning. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, German, but I forget it a little bit. But anyway, thank you so much for this kind invitation. It's the second time that I come to the Schiller Institute, which I like very much. A few years ago, I was invited by uh, Claudio Celani, who is uh, my colleague, and uh, to 
My greetings to Helga, who is a fantastic person, who is just dealing with these things in such a way that I'm very proud to be here for that. Um, I have a presentation. I hope I can go. OK. Let us start with this idea that uh, Europe and, uh, and uh, Africa should be sister, should be brown. There is a bridge. It's a liquid bridge. We have the duty to solidify this bridge. Uh, the Mediterranean uh, Sea is a big lake. If you look at that, what we miss is just an arrow from Europe to Asia. And this is the increment of the presentation which I made with respect to four, four years ago. And uh, I don't go too much into detail, but if you look to the corridors, it is easy to understand that it is impossible to go to, to, go to uh, Africa if you don't have a kind of fixed link between Sicily and, uh, and Tunisia. So Tunisia will be the door of uh, Italy and Europe to the Africa, as far as uh, Albania will be the door from Italy and Europe to Asia through Greece and uh, maybe Turkey or on the north, the Black Sea. Uh, this is uh, what uh, in the north they are dealing with. That's a red banana, this name. Investors are very good. They have uh, a lot of in, uh, incremental things, but you see the most important part of the Mediterranean shipment, say more or less at the moment, 2,000 ships per month, it will be 4,000 ships per month in a few years, 80% goes to the north, moving through Gibraltar. And this is a loss of timing, a waste of money, and why not going ahead? This is a Sometimes I use French because the French is more similar to Italian, but I like it very much. And uh, you see, my dream, let us dream together, because without dream, you can't look to the future. This is a very important question. You have to let your heart speaking. And put your heart beyond this obstacle. You see? My dream is to connect Cape Town to Beijing. Huge, fantastic. But Leonardo? What was Leonardo 400, 500 years ago? He was dreaming, visionary engineering. Without vision, you have no future. And for that respect, we, are, we, 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 we thought it was possible to connect all this through UNESCO. UNESCO is culture. All the points you see here are UNESCO side in a different way. And this is a very important point. Through Africa, you have a lot of UNESCO sites. In China, you have a lot of UNESCO sites. And also, I don't speak about Italy, of course. This is self-evident. I'm Italian. <laughs> so no need to, to show what we have. I just remember 55 years ago, I spent four months in Germany. This is a small joke. But we went and see some ruins, and in the bus, I was very young, 20 years old only, and now I'm a three-quarter of a century, which is a very nice age. And somebody says, if there is any Italian in the bus, please stay in the bus. <laughs> and I appreciate this, because it means that if you have small things, you like them. If you have too many things, as in Italy, Unfortunately, at least from the political point of view, we don't like it. We see Venice. I was professor in, in the School of Architecture in Venice for 44 years, and my heart is, is there. But now I am rector of an online university, it's more universal, more the Schiller Institute attitude, universal. That's very important. Let's go ahead with this. This is Africa, you see, and this is, I called it a, Ulisse Corridor, because you can, we come to Homerus, the myth. This is part of our history, the tradition. We are because we were, we will be because we are. Our tradition, our history is our future. We have to remember always this. And China, sometimes we forget that China has a very large history. 
not only for Marco Polo that we know, of course, I am, I'm somehow Venetian. Uh, you see, I, I call it the Tunate, Grabate, because what could be originally was Albate, Albania and, and Italy. But then I, we cannot miss Greece. Greece is part of our life. Egnatia Road, Egnatia Road. So Grabate, Greece, Albania and Italy. I don't want to say that Italy will be the center. This is a transit. The logistic situation will be a door from one side to the other and try to connect. We have the Magna Grecia in the south of Italy. Sometimes I say that there is more Greece in the south of Italy than in Greece itself, because it was more uh, preserved. We call about Taormina Theater or Selinunter from one side, or uh, the Locride, I mean, the, the, uh, all the part that you have in Calabria and also in Puglia. I go very, very fast because I have uh, no time. I, I know that everybody's hungry now. Hungry or hungry, it depends. <laughs> Sorry, I'm joking, you know. Uh, and uh, and uh, you, you need Messina Bridge in that respect, it will be something more than connecting just Messina and Reggio Calabria. And then you have the Bosphorus, and Bosphorus, you know, you have a lot of things. The Turkey, till a few years ago, they were really very, very much done. Now I don't, uh, I'm not so much convinced that the future will be easy for them. Anyway, I don't want. They did three corridor. The, the, the three corridors, uh, uh, you see, the, the central part, the one corridor goes to, to Tripoli, uh, Libya, and the other part goes to Alger, uh, to Alger. Therefore, you connect them and then you have. And Suez Canal, if you cross the Suez Canal, you want to go on the east side, you find Israel. That's impossible to cross. I think the, uh, these are the most important uh, wall there, actually build bridges and destroy walls. This is our Pope and also the Chinese colleagues say this. But I say, if you find a wall, you have to destroy the wall and with the same stones you build the bridge. This is an advanced idea. Here's my, sometime I try to be poet. <laughs> but this idea to connect Sicily and, and, and Tunisia is not only my idea, it's just, just uh, uh, almost 14 years ago, Enea, who is a very important uh, research center, uh, proposed a tunnel from one side to the other. It's with four intermediate islands. The red line means that uh, the ship, 2,000 per month, actually, 4,000 in a few years. And uh, with this intermediate island, I so why not uh, putting a bridge? Of course, you just reverse. I'm a bridge man sometime. I, I, people call me. This is the original idea. Then we change a little bit with um, some artificial island. It's, it's not possible. Is it not possible? No, it is possible. It's just 80% uh, of the investment could be as a revenue. It's a matter of thinking in a different way. Of course, uh, I go. I finally, we decided to have a, a part of a submerged tunnel for a, some technical reason. I have no time to discuss, but this will be very important than also the, the bridge. I go, I come to Valona Otranto. It's Valona Otranto. It could be also in a, in a different position. This is the shortest way, of course, and we have to go to Puglia, if you know Puglia. Maybe Puglia is uh, one of the most beautiful regions we have in, uh, in Italy, with the olives and uh, other things, uh, Albero Bello and so on. So I like very much thinking to our past. And the other side, Valona. Now Albania is growing so much. Albania is maybe, a, is maybe what, part of Europe more than other countries. Why not getting Albania in, in Europe? We are in favor. Unfortunately, not all Europe is convinced. That's the same with the, with the Silk Road. I mean, the, the, the relationship between U European Union and, uh, and, and, uh, and China is something which I personally do not believe. I think bridges should be mainly human bridges, political bridges, from one heart to the other, and smile. Smile is the door of happiness. If you meet somebody and they smile, their, their, their heart open. The sun is coming, they heat it, and it forms a bridge of flowers. This is my point. Bridge of flowers. 
just to show that it's possible to do things like this. It's make, instead of thinking to the next election, please think a little bit more far. In the year 60, we made Europe with a different mentality. Now Europe is full of walls. Why? Because everybody thinks to his particular, which is losing. Everybody is losing. This is the reason why I like very much the Schiller Institute, because they open the mind. They, they try to let understand that beyond your particular thing, there is a lot of future for everybody. The migrants cannot be solved with wolves cannot be solved just paying somebody that they avoid to come. We have to think about it for a global solution. And maybe also this hypothesis could help because we can have thousands and thousands of people working and connecting them. Don't look about that. This is just uh, the big problem is that we have 800 meters deep, which is very difficult, but uh, if it is impossible, I like it. Sometimes I remember that I am an engineer originally. Then I was, uh, I mean, regulated a little bit because I was teaching bridges to the architects. So I became an architect, honoris causa, for my bridges because I, I'm a bridge builder and all my bridges are very nice. Not so big, but very nice, mainly the human bridges. And, uh, but let us uh, see what was the idea, just very quick. But I like uh, poesy. Poetic thoughts. Is it an eye? It's more. What you see inside this eye, what you see about this color. Don't worry about the fact that maybe it comes from Middle East. Maybe it's Islamic. Islamic is the third step of monotheism. First is Jewish, second is Christian, Christianity, and third. Why not thinking together? It's difficult, I understand, but the inspiration, the inspiration of this eye is this one. An ellipse, and from the ellipse, just a cross-section of the... It's an invention, but we have to capture the attention of the people. We have to convince that it is possible to think and dream. Let's go. I don't enter too much into details, but... Fortunately, my foundation is very strong because I'm an engineer, but uh, with some, uh, uh, I, I find myself a transgenic engineer. Maybe you understand I'm not so much engineer, an organism genetically modified. <laughs> but uh, I like very much this idea. And, uh, okay, uh, the safety and, and other things because, uh, you know, go underneath is not very easy. And uh, let us finish with Messina Bridge which is my dream, which become a nightmare. For political reason, we decide to cancel a contract. Never seen in the history if there is some people that use brain. Just for political reason. They cancel, it was a fantastic. And my idea is this one. Again, dreaming, why not putting some skyscraper, 400 meters high, Sheila and Caridi, the the, la the lamp of the Mediterranean, and thinking that Calabria and Sicily could be connected, as it was with uh, Ulisse and Enea. I would like to finish, uh, why not think it to Metcoin? We had the Sestertius at the time of, uh, of uh, maybe we can connect. I know that it's, a, it's, a, it's a dream now, but maybe inspiring the ideas of Lyndon LaRouche, I really realized that this is, it is not impossible. So, again, what is the, the translation of bridges? That's some of them with UNESCO. I would like to show you that uh, in Chinese, bridges pronounced ciao. Ciao is universal, like pizza and spaghetti, I think. <laughs> like arrivederci and so on. I mean, our Italian. I, I, I come to the conclusion because I was dealing with this bridge in uh, Golden Horn, I saved the bridge because UNESCO didn't want this bridge. So I solved the problem getting the possibility to show that people can have a look to the historic peninsula of uh, Istanbul, Constantinople, Byzantius, and so 
interact with the tradition, interact. You have to leave these things. This is a picture taken by my co cooperation. So an architect, I am in Galata Bridge, and I was just trying. Give me a point and I, I will do the impossible thing. This is my dream, which I would like to share with you. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, Professor Siviero. We are now having our session of questions and answers. Uh, the speakers may ask questions to each other, and the room is open for questions to the speakers. So please be ready to ask the questions that you should answer. So Thank you. Come, the best is to come here in the middle, so feel free to ask. Hello, my name is Robert. I have a question to Natalia Vitrenko. I, want, uh, I would like to ask you, what do you think about uh, the idea, the charitable idea of new Albania state inside, in, inside Albania, where now, as I know, could be located an army force, maybe from US, to invade Europe? I don't know, I don't know is, uh, if it's that true, I would like to uh, uh, ask you this question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, I want to ask you, what do you think doing? about uh, the um, presence of uh, and of uh, this uh, uh, do, what do you think about the uh, the same idea of uh, this new Albania inside uh, now inside the Albania uh, state? The, um, the idea to can uh, invade the Europe uh, with the, the evil, for me, evil um, idea of this new Albania. Um, Albania? Albania? The new Albania. Какое отношение новая Албания имеет к Украине? Okay, no, no, it's, um, it's not a question about a connection between Albania and Ukraine. It's a question about uh, the presence in uh, Albania uh, of uh, um, military military um, from US probably to, of is, uh, of Islamic people to can invade the earth of Europe, but I don't know if that's true. Лена, нет звука. Что там разместились американцы, он имеет в виду, что американцы влияют на Албанию, на всю Европу, на Украину в том числе. То есть вот ваше мнение по поводу всей ситуации в целом, именно как влияние на Европу. На мой взгляд, вообще события в Украине, которые развиваются э, за последние 30 лет, это реализация планов США. 
Um, so basically, uh, Natalia Vitrenko believes that what is happening uh, in Europe for the past 30 years even uh, is the implementation of the American uh, American plans. Их главные враги на планете это Россия и Китай. And of course, their main enemies in the on the planet are Russia and China. Чтобы Россию расчленить, чтобы Россию уничтожить, они решили использовать Украину. And they decided to destroy and dissect Russia by, uh, by through using Ukraine. А то, что Вашингтон управляет абсолютно всеми процессами на Украине, это уже секрет Полишинеля. Это уже знают все. And uh, the fact uh, that Washington is um, orchestrating everything that's happening in Ukraine is a known fact to everyone. Okay. Merci beaucoup. J'ai une série de questions au professeur Ostrovsky sur l'ambassadeur du conseil économique de ex conseil économique de l'ambassade de Chine et mon idée revient sur le fait que les idées de monsieur Larouche sont aussi importantes actuellement pour l'humanité c'est vrai mais le paradigme qui est posé dans ce sens que l'Inde la Chine la Russie et les États-Unis doivent en fait organiser une meilleure coopération en vue de sauver l'humanité Il me semble qu'il manque un cinquième pied, c'est l'Afrique. Pourquoi je dis l'Afrique Elle est présente, mais elle n'est pas suffisamment présente. Elle est présente dans ce sens que tout le monde court vers les minéraux de l'Afrique, mais personne ne veut parler de l'Afrique. Alors que la prochaine guerre, disons la prochaine guerre mondiale, c'est la guerre pour l'Afrique. Tout le monde organise des sommets. Sommet France-Afrique, Chine-Afrique, Russie-Afrique. Mais qu'est-ce qu'il y a derrière le sommet Après le sommet Russie-Afrique, qu'est-ce qu'il y a derrière Regardez la route de la soie et la ceinture. C'est une idée géniale. Mais elle ne peut réellement avoir lieu que si les Africains sont effectivement libres et développent leurs idées pour pouvoir participer à ce que l'humanité veut effectivement organiser. Surtout, cette idée d'une route entre Cap Town et Pékin peut se réaliser, mais pas dans les conditions actuelles. Il y a encore trop de dictateurs en Afrique et les Africains ne sont pas libres. Mais ça ne veut pas dire que les Africains sont la cinquième route de la charrette. Pas du tout. Les Africains ont une conscience pour se développer et contribuer au développement de l'humanité. Il suffit de leur en donner les moyens. Il ne s'agit pas de mettre la couleur blanche sur la couleur noire ni la couleur noire sur la couleur blanche, mais plutôt créer... But we have to create a cooperation between white and black people together for humanity as a whole. So I want to have a clear answer of Professor Ostrovsky. Of course, he's working on the Far East region, but what is behind the summit, Russia-Africa summit? of Sochi, because, or China-Africa summit, the FOCAC summit. We have to do something else. What France is doing in Africa is well known, and Africans know well what is going on. But uh, Africans are not happy about this. But we don't want that the Russia-Africa summit or the China-Africa summit is the same. Je vous, thank you very much. Um, it's a very interesting question, but in my opinion, uh, this question uh, um, does not connect with uh, my t topic, but nevertheless, uh, as far as uh, Russia earlier in 50s and 60s and 70s, Russia has very severe positions in uh, Africa, but uh, after 1991, Russia lost its position in different countries of Africa, for example, and uh, now just uh, uh, our uh, our country is going to develop 
its positions in Africa, because we lost our positions not only in Africa, but in, uh, even in the countries of uh, just uh, of former republics of, uh, of the Soviet Union. And uh, now, judging by current situation, Russia is going to develop to develop its, posi its positions in Africa. But and after that, uh, you, as far as you know, we are going to just to re-establish our assist economic assistance in some African countries, uh, for example, uh, in the Central African Republic, for example, and in any other countries. And in my opinion, uh, Russia is going going to re-establish uh, re its influence in the uh, African continent. That's my point of view on this issue. Um, <clears throat> the <clears throat> economic counselor of, of China had to go because he has another event in the evening and he has to travel. But I, let me just answer to you <clears throat> that there is no question that the economic industrialization of Africa will be the moral decisive question where mankind will go. This has been our position since the 70s. Uh, the La Rouge organization, we have published the first comprehensive plan for the industrialization of Africa in 1976. This was actually our first development plan of all of them. So you can adduce from that and also what Mr. LaRouche said in the video, which was from 98 or 97, that you know, we have the fullest commitment to the industrialization of, of the entire African continent. And I can only say that President Putin has reiterated many times that Russia will help to lit up Africa with electricity, with fusion, with nuclear fission power. Uh, Russia is right now cooperating with many African and other countries of the developing countries to develop nuclear energy. And if Europe continues like what we are doing right now, you know, soon Africa will be fully equipped with energy and electricity based on nuclear power, and Europe will be dark uh, because of wind and solar. So the only reason why we are keep mentioning the Russia, China, India, United States cooperation as the beginning is because you need a combination of countries which is representative of all of nations, but at the same time also powerful enough to impose the kind of changes which are required against the city of London and Wall Street. It is not exclusive. So I just wanted to say that very emphatically, you know, that, that the future vision of the world will be one, you know, where every country's sovereignty will be respected in like Nicolaus von Cusa talking that harmony in the microcosm, you can only have if all microcosms develop to the mutual benefit of each other. So that is, I think, extremely important to, to underline. Bonjour. Uh, ma question est pour uh, également le professeur Andrei So my question is also for the professor Ostrovsky. So you are speak about the development of the east region of Russia and the cooperation between China and Russia and you mention uh, the uh, banking obstacles. The problem we have with the banking institution and the Schiller Institute is fighting for the what we call the Glass-Steagall Act internationally. And uh, I don't know if I know that China has this kind of separation between commercial banking and speculative uh, banking, and how it works in uh, Russia. Please, thank you for your answer. May I answer the, the question which you put, uh, how is possible the corridors actually. I have been in Nigeria many times. There is some studies and somebody who's just uh, not only thinking, but also uh, performing this idea to have a green corridors. Green corridors means that they will be self-sufficient in energy. Of course, we understand there are some political problems now, but at least the part from Nigeria through Algeria, finally, is possible now, and investment somehow they are getting 
to, to have them. Of course, we need the cooperation, as uh, Lindo LaRouche said, without uh, working together, we cannot do anything. We cannot reduce, again, slaves. And it's a different way of sl slaveness, actually, but still we are slaves. We are slaves of the financial, which is just, is just producing money. If money produces money, this is unethic, and this is against the God. Yes. I'd like to dwell on the situation uh, in, with the Sino-Russian trade and economic cooperation, not only as a whole, but in the forest. As far as you know, last year, 2018, uh, 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 our trade volume just uh, achieved uh, a good result, uh, 108 billion uh, American dollars. Just, it, but now, nevertheless, Russia takes only the 11th place, just in Chinese uh, trade volume. But uh, in my opinion, the, just a Russian father to develop uh, uh, mutual cooperation between uh, Russian, the Russian Far East and Siberia uh, and, the Chinese, and Chinese Northeast is uh, just uh, the main reserve of the development of our just uh, trade uh, and economic cooperation. Because judging by statistical data, the, the ratio of uh, just uh, trade volume of our Russian Far East is only 20% of the whole of the total uh, trade volume. But um, why? Now just, uh, I mean, there are different uh, just, uh, directions of uh, mutual Sino-Russian cooperation. But in my opinion, I just, uh, before my visit uh, here, just I discussed these problems with uh, financial experts from banking uh, and informational sources, and they declared that our banking cooperation in banking sphere is very uh, slow, is very, is, very, is very bad. For example, now, uh, we have only one, uh, just uh, bank, I mean, uh, VTB24 has uh, its uh, just uh, uh, branch in China, in Shanghai. Many other banks, for example, Sberbank, our the most, the strongest bank in Russia, yeah, now it uh, has not its uh, branch, it has only its representative, representative office. And uh, judging by our, our just uh, banking cooperation, just we develop our cooperation with China, not uh, just uh, directly, but uh, through the third, uh, I mean, the, the third banks, usually uh, Republican Bank of New York in the U.S. and in the USA, and it just uh, hampers uh, Russian-China, Sino-Russian trade cooperation. And speaking about our forest, now, for example, more than 20 years ago, uh, just our central bank, cent central bank, tried to develop our mutual cooperation and uh, use using some experiments, but in a few years all these experiments were stopped. I don't know why, but nevertheless, now the situation is because I just have said that we have four just directions of, of uh, Sino-Russian mutual cooperation, and banking cooperation is uh, the weakest link of this cooperation, and that's, I, in my opinion, it, it, uh, we should develop our cooperation in financial sphere. That's uh, because now two sides, we made a lot of uh, just uh, negotiations on this issue, and I myself took part in this uh, just uh, negotiation via internet uh, last summer, but uh, no results at all. Unfortunately, that's a problem in the Sina Russian uh, just uh, trade and economic development. I uh, should admit this uh, fact. Thank you very much. My name is Gabriele Fitkau. My name is Gabriele Fitkau. Uh, 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 Professor Severo, I have a question. She don't look like the Chinese uh, <laughs> ambassador. I, 
like to have an answer to your very entertaining presentation about the many corridors that w were possible between Africa and Europe. My question is, is there an idea uh, going toward the West, toward America? There are a areas which are secluded that uh, cannot uh, uh, earn their living. What is the idea to include those countries and areas into the New Silk Road? As for this question, I am a very, 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 very open mind. <laughs> I could go to infinite if you want, eh? because uh, as a bridge builder, mainly human bridges, of course it's open. At the moment, it, it starts as a visionary idea, but I think year by year that it becomes more and more concrete. Of course, at the moment, I must confess, nobody in Italy is interested. Maybe they are thinking in a different way, but uh, this is a big mistake. Uh, we will pay this mistake. And uh, I think that from the south, I am convinced that uh, uh, the possibility is more concrete. From the east, uh, it depends. It depends from this uh, one belt, one road. Uh, because the idea to connect with the Silk Road if you think and uh, you look to the geographic situation, the strategy of the future is not to go only to the north. Of course, this is not to avoid. But if you reach the Piraeus from one side, you just stay at the level of Ignatia Road. I mean, the Roman roads, till now, they are showing the best way. And the Silk Road was invented, as far as I know, many, many centuries ago. As I said, Marco Polo, the Venetian, Start. So why not going to, to the America? In uh, the Vladivostok and the Bering, the Bering Strait, they are still thinking about the crossing. I mean, in all over the world, they are crossing similar things. I mean, 60, 70, 80, even 100 kilometer connection is really at now possible. One not 140 kilometers in the south to Tunisia, maybe moving through Pantelleria. And on the other side, it's just 80 kilometers. And Albania, as I said, could be the door. The door means that you open. When you open a door, you open your heart. It means that you want to go beyond. You want to cross the people. You, you, you like to move onto a bridge and understand who are the other, because sometimes hating the other is because you know, do not know the other. And Linton Rarouche is able to connect people. This is the, I mean, the result from all over the world. We are here, we're talking, talking open mind. And of course, I am an engineer, so I'm trying to make a visionary engineer, but with some pylons, I would say. But anyway, I really believe that the future is this. Without infrastructure, there is no development. And infrastructure means that you can connect all people, you can give them water, not only energy. Water is maybe the most important point for the future, more than oil and other things, mainly connecting people. Thank you. I just want to point to a presentation we hear tomorrow from Mr. Dennis Small, who is actually our Schiller Institute representative for Latin America, who has worked with uh, Lyndon LaRouche and our movement since, since the 70s. Uh, you know, we worked with Lopez Portillo on a Latin American integration called Operation Juarez. And, you know, right now we are in the middle of, you know, very concrete projects with many, you know, whole Latin American integration with North America via the Bering Strait. So if our efforts are successful, we very soon can travel with a maglev train from the southern tip of Argentina and Chile to Cape of Good Hope in South Africa, all the way through the land a connection. That's our vision, and I think that that will uh, be realized 
quicker than people think, I hope. My name is Neudecker. Ich habe um, my name is N uh, Neudecker. I have a question and, and, and a gift from our American friends from the Schiller Institute. Uh, Linton LaRouche's exceptional writings, uh, das sind also die, uh, the, it's on a USB stick and people can get this at, at the book table. And uh, this, this stick includes 12 books, about 12 books by Linton LaRouche uh, on one stick. We wanted to have the first volume uh, ready for this conference. This was too difficult. We will have it in print only at the next US conference, but with this USB stick, we wanted to give people the opportunity to study the most important uh, uh, works of La Rouge uh, at hand. We're now in the process of art to art put put the whole everything into uh, what Lynn had in terms of uh, internet forums. Uh, this is like the Leibniz uh, complete works. It's 500 volumes. But start with that stick and it's a good uh, opportunity to start this process. And we are really serious about the uh, renaissance of Lin's ideas. My name is Moneka. I'm coming from Albania. I have been former ambassador of Albania to China. I'm very interested in this conference. I thank you very much for inviting us to be part of this very interesting event. We are a few Albanians here. And I don't have any question. I just want to thank you and to make clear that Albania is not a hub of terrorist Islamic. Albania is a very potential NATO member. We don't have any US army there to protect us from Islamism or from terrorists. We are a potential candidate for being a member of EU, as uh, Professor Enzo mentioned before. Albania is very open to Belt and Road Initiative, to 17 plus one initiative. We are with hearts and with minds there. So th I think that we will support this initiative, we'll support this kind of events. We thank you very much, and that's all. Thank you very much. No, no, no. On 9th of December, we will, have a we will have a conference in Tirana about this matter. So it, it, it's going. Helga, you, you, this is Michelle from Denmark. You started to uh, answer my question. Can you say more about this Linen LaRouche Legacy Foundation, both the books and also the other aspect that you mentioned about circulation, the ideas, and also just speak personally to the people here what, what Linen LaRouche means for everybody personally? Also, wir haben gerade die La Rouge Legacy Foundation. Uh, am I speaking English? Um, uh, Legacy Foundation. Uh, we just founded it. Uh, it's it's uh, it's registered, and it will take about a couple of months to finalize it. But it can start working already right now. We have applied with the uh, you know the authorities in in the United States. And the idea behind it is that, you know, Lin has, and those of you who, who have known him, uh, Lin has produced such an unbelievable amount of, of intellectual product. I think that there is 
and I'm not saying that because I'm his wife or widow, you know, I really think I have an objective point of view that I do not know of any thinker of the 20s uh, into the 21st century who has such a scope of knowledge, who has produced so many creative uh, concepts in the fields of science, of history, of philosophy, of music, of poetry. And he has especially developed a unique method. It's not so much the concrete facts and predicates, but it is a method of thinking, which I think is absolutely precious and must be replicated. So the idea with this <clears throat> foundation is that we will pr produce over time, because it is an enormous amount of work, uh, the collected works of Lin, uh, but we also want to make it like a presidential library where people eventually will have access to all of these things via the internet, um, and that can become the basis for a curriculum of universities and studies. Because <clears throat> what most people have forgotten or, or don't know is that you know, before this same apparatus in the United States, which is now making the coup against uh, Trump, um, before that attacked us in 1986 when they raided our offices and, and, and uh, home, you know, this that was an unbelievable uh, force of 400 uh, <clears throat> armed FBI agents and others who attacked our home. And then, you know, they started the prosecution against my husband and some of his colleagues, which we'll hear tomorrow about. Uh, and they threw him in jail innocently for five years. Some of his writings, which you can find on this, on this USB stick, he wrote from prison without any notes, without any books, just out of his mind. And if you want to have any proof about creativity is when people have, you know, to write such books without any, any means. You know, nowadays people can't write anything without Googling and, you know, looking at all kinds of measures. But Lynn did a lot of his most creative writings in prison. So, you know, when they, when they um, did that against us, the mode of our organization shifted dramatically. Because until 1986, we were very, very optimistic, upbeat. You know, we were about to found three private universities because we were at that time in contact with about 100 professors who all said that this LaRouche method of thinking is so important that we should use it as a curriculum in a university. And all you need to found a university is professors. You know, if you have like 50 or 20 or 30 professors, you can found a university. And we wanted to do that in Peru, uh, in the United States, and in Germany. And you know, that unfortunately got abruptly stopped you know, because they did not want to only to put my husband in jail, but they wanted to put his ideas out of business. They wanted to ostracize the name of La Rouge, you know, that you can never get to his ideas uh, again. And what we are now doing is not only we are fighting for his exoneration, and, you know, maybe we can uh, write a resolution out of this conference, you know, where if you agree, the conference could adopt a demand to Trump to exonerate my husband. Uh, because I think, <clears throat> I think that the, the future of humanity, you know, will be if we have one, and that's right now not a guaranteed question, the future of humanity will be in tune of the ideas of Lyndon LaRouche meaning that you know, the only things which will be accepted as truth is those things which can be universally proven either in science, because experiment, experiments which can be repeated, you know, that is proof. And the same goes for great classical art. So you know, what we are doing with the effort to you know, have a renaissance of La Rouge ideas is not just to commemorate the ideas of a particular outstanding person, 
but it is really the idea that we need to have a complete paradigm shift and more people have to start thinking in creative ways. And the work of my husband is the absolute most important key to accomplish that. So I can only say, you know, that, you know, Lynn is alive, you know, if, if we make him alive, I mean, he's alive in me and he's alive in many of my comrades and colleagues. And I would invite you, you know, to not look at Lynn as something which has passed, but it can be like Schiller, like Cusanus, like Beethoven. It can be an incredible source of strength for our daily fight if we in, involve ourselves in deeply in his ideas. And I would like you to all go out of this conference and you know start studying La Rouge, because that is the most important message we can take out of this conference. Okay. Um, good day to everybody. I was, um, I'm King Didier Kusu. I was invited to uh, Dean, uh, who is from Chila Institute, Dean Andromeda from Wiesbaden. All right, um, I was, I'm very, I was attracted to the, um, to the idea, to the subject, um, the future of humanity as a creative species in the universe. Um, Mrs. LaRouche said something very important that Mr. LaRouche wrote, if I understood it clearly, a book while he was uh, in a prison. So he didn't need anything nor to do any research, but just from his mind. So we are very powerful being. So when I read the future of humanity as a creative species in the universe, so you're talking about you the being who is created in the image of the creator. If you, if I take a picture of you, any picture, I show you a picture, you will see your face. So if the creator, what you may call God, created you in his own image, that means you are God. So, no, it's not about question, it's about, yeah. So, um, he asked, him, he asked me what is my question. It's not directly my question, but it's, um, the question maybe will come later on, but just uh, briefly, okay? Because that's very important. It's like uh, based on my own little experience on this material level, knowing how to create out of nothing, knowing practically how the manifestation from the spiritual power and you create something in this world and to try to make a real change, not with theories, but a real change in this world. So there is a process. That's the reason why uh, this gathering is so great. Uh, I wasn't really uh, acquainted with, with Mr. Lowrish. Um, but I did a little, you know, few researches, and I was like, wow, what a brilliant mind. What a brilliant mind. But the power, like I heard from some speakers, or Miss, Mrs. Laurus also, have, you know, pointed the city of London, the power in the financial sectors. The power, the minds that are gathering here are very powerful if you really know who you really are. And the people who are operating in this sector that, just an example, you said city of London, you have, you know, Wall Street and et cetera. They are well aware how actually you can manipulate the mind, how you can use the energy of your mind in order to achieve 
your agenda, what you want to achieve. And if people who want to actually to bring something positive on this planet, to make a real change for the future of humanity as a creative species, it is important that we understand that we are creators. You are a creative species. You are very powerful. It's not people on the Wall Street are more powerful than you. You are powerful if you really know who you are. And if you are, you just need to understand the process, the creative process from your spiritual power into manifestation. And if everyone understand that, and in a practical sense, we can really create a huge impact, but you got to be intense, because when you're creating on a spiritual level, that energy need to gather density in order to materialize in this world. So there is a process. And if anyone can understand that process, then we simply, uh, let me put it very simple, we are very powerful as we are here. And the vision, I think, uh, is a great vision. I will buy, also get some books, you know, try to read, try to learn. I think everyone should do that because it is really a great thing and I'm happy to be here. Right. Well, thank you for your very insightful remarks, which I think are very much in line what we are trying to do, because it is exactly that, you know, catalyzing in each human being this inner freedom. I mean, the reason why the Schiller Institute is called Schiller Institute is because Friedrich Schiller was, of all the thinkers I know, I mean, other than my husband, the person who, who had the most emphasis on the inner freedom, you know, I mean, this was his famous controversy with Immanuel Kant, why he did not like the categorical imperative, because he said, those of us who love freedom more than anything else, we cannot even watch the procedure, how the moral person suppresses his emotions so that he can be moral, which was what Kant said, you know. So Schiller said that the opposite is to educate people to be beautiful souls. These are the people who do with passion their duty, who do uh, necessity as freedom. In other words, if you submit to this larger process and find your freedom in doing what is necessary for the, I would say, durable sustainability of mankind as a whole, you are free. And to add to evoke that and get people independent of, you know, outside manipulation, which is when you are a, a being of the senses, you can be manipulated because how, how do you recruit agents? Money, sex, you know, appealing to pride uh, and other such uh, sins. And how do you get free of that? By simply developing the kind of intellectual power combined with the education of your emotions up to the level of reason, and then you are free. They may still physically attack you, they may still destroy you, and Schiller in his writings about the sublime says, you know, once you connect your fate to the larger issues of mankind, you may not be physically safe, but you are morally safe, and then they cannot get you. So I think that, you know, that concept and also what you say about the density is really important because it doesn't help you much if you are a well-meaning lazy bum you know you may have good impulses and correct moral views but to be a genius you have to be industrious i asked Lynn several times he said how how comes that you are such a genius and he said i'm just industrious <laughs> <laughs> and I think tenacity, you know, to stay at it when you know that you have an important mission. You have to be full of tenacity, and that is what you say with the density, to become a material force. So I congratulate you to your views and, you know, look forward for our cooperation.
Well, I think that we should end this morning panel with this challenge, this challenge for all of us, and be prepared to ask the best of all possible questions this afternoon after the first session, the end session of this panel, and then our second panel later on. So let's be prepared and be ready for the best of all possible worlds that we have to create. Thank you. So now I have the honor to introduce uh, to you Leonidas Chrysantopoulos, Ambassador at Honorem from Greece. He's also a former Secretary General of the Organization of the Black Sea Economic Cooperation. And he's going to speak on developing relations between Greece and the Belt and Road, which perfectly continues the discussion which we have started this morning. Please. This is our first annual conference without Lyndon. He is missed, but his spirit is, is with us. Of all his many and inspiring writings, I was most impressed by his knowledge of classical ancient Greek thought, philosophy, and tragedy, and his effort to use those as a basis of solving the current problems of humanity. Allow me to quote him on his three views of Prometheus from the article Prometheus and Europe published in 1999. And I quote, the various reasonably well-informed but conflicting appreciations of the classical Greek image of the figure Prometheus may be assorted among three moral classifications. This leads us towards a still more profound conception, one of great importance for understanding the crisis of extended European civilization worldwide today. The first of the three Contrasted views of Prometheus is a morally repulsive one. It is fairly summed up as judging Prometheus as either guilty of the crime of hubris against all the pagan gods, or as a tragic figure fallen victim to his own error of tactical indiscretion of breaking the club rules of the oligarchical game. The second view of Prometheus is the view of Prometheus as perhaps a tragic figure, shaking his angry fist, expressing thus a supposedly noble spirit of a revolt, the oppressed against the bad gods. The third view, which is introduced by Aeschylus, Prometheus bound, defines the tyrant Zeus, not the hero Prometheus, as a tragic figure of the drama. Ze Zeus is that tyrant and crooked judge whose beastly defiance of the immortal Prometheus brought doom upon not only Zeus, but all of the gods of Olympus. Lacking the two lost parts of the trilogy, we must place greater responsibility among other evidence in our searches into the meaning of the continuing deep relationship between the Prometheus image and the political history of European civilization. Such is the, is the wisdom of Linden. We also remain indebted to Linden for his positive statements on the Greek debt that gave courage to the people of my country, as I had told him in our conversations. The maritime Silk Road connecting China with Europe also involves Greece. However, before going into the details of the Greek involvement, the current economic situation of that country should be taken into consideration. Greece, after 10 years of austerity measures imposed by the EU and its international lenders, continues to remain in a situation of economic catastrophe, in spite of positive noise and numbers coming from the EU about growth rates, etc. 
The essence is that these positive numbers have not become reality. They have not reached the people. While Greece has lost its sovereignty and its economic policy, it will be made in Brussels for the next 100 years. Public debt as a percentage of GDP has increased from 124% in 2010 to 185% today and, continuings, and continues growing. And the reason that we went into the memorandum process was exactly to eliminate this debt. Pensions were never increased after they were decreased by 60%. And the health system remains collapsed while overtaxation prevails. Death rates continue to augment. In 2013, they were 70,830. They reached 124,000 in 2017, while the suicide rate has increased by 45%. No end is in sight to resolve the crisis for the people of Greece that has been imposed by erroneous policies of the EU and the IMF. We are also, we have been inundated uh, since 2015 of, uh, by over one million refugees or migrants, which is a very uh, difficult situation for Greece to handle. Now, Greece being under the economic occupation of Germany and the EU, at the same time, it recently signed a framework of agreements with the USA, the most important being the updated Mutual Defense Cooperation Agreement, which was signed in Athens last month. It will enable the two countries to expand bilateral military activities uh, in some places in Greece and sustain increased activity at the naval support activity Suda Bay in Crete. The agreement is not very popular with the Greek people who cannot see who the enemy is. For the U.S., this agreement makes Greece another U.S. military base, allowing it to better control the East Mediterranean and the Middle East. In order to differentiate its foreign policy from German and U.S. policies, Greece decided to improve relations with Russia with the official visit of the Greek foreign minister to Moscow on November 6. Relations between the two countries were at their lowest ever in the summer of last year when diplomats in Athens and Moscow were expelled. Greece expelled first, the reason being that Moscow was providing, was providing funds to Greek organizations that were against the bilateral agreement between Athens and Skopje, a reason that was deemed by many as ridiculous. I mean, I, I also participated in the demonstrations and, and the activities against this, this agreement. We had funding problems and we never found funds, as was said by the Greek government that the Russians were providing funds. Uh, the visit had positive results, relations improved, and the consultation protocol was signed for the period 2020-2022. And Greece also assumed uh, uh, the responsibility to try improve relations between Russia and the EU. Enhancing relations with China was part of Greece's foreign policy from 2005, even before the economic collapse. In November 2008, talks between Greece and China resulted in a contract between Costco and the Piraeus Port Authority that gave the former 35 years as operators of two piers in the port. In 2016, the Greek government sold 51% of its shares in uh, the Piraeus Port Authorities to Costco, thus making the Chinese company the owner and operator of all three piers of the container terminal, but also of the ferry port, cruise ship, port, car terminal, and ship repair facilities. Costco succeeded in increasing the annual container turnover from 685,000 tons in 2010 to 5 million last year. The activities of Costco in Piraeus constitute the most important activity to date of China's One Belt, One Road approach in Europe. In March 2017, Greece was given prospective membership of, to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and became a full non-regional member this August. The bank addresses infrastructure needs in Asia. 
In April of this year, Greece joined the cooperation initiative between China and the Central and Eastern European countries. This is an initiative founded in 2012 in Budapest, aiming to push for cooperation between the 17 plus one countries and to promote the Belt and Road Initiative. 18 members of the EU are participating. In spite of that, the European Commission and other hardcore countries of the EU are not looking favorably at this initiative, and neither at the Chinese influence in Greece. This also demonstrates the uncoordinated policies of the EU. It should be reminded here that during the, the negotiations of the first half of 2015 between Greece and the Troika to solve the debt crisis of Greece, Berlin intervened to Beijing and prevented it from buying Greek T-bills of 1.4 billion euros, which might have solved at that time many issues. In 2017, Greece vetoed an EU condemnation of China human rights at the United Nations. The US is also not favorable towards the closer relations of Greece with China. Pompeo, during his October visit to Athens said, I quote, I raised our concern about Chinese investments in technology and infrastructure and criticized China for allegedly using economic means to coerce countries into lopsided deals that benefit Beijing and leave its clients mired in debt. Unaffected by US pressure, Greece proceeded to safeguard its national interest and increased investment opportunities. The Prime Minister of Greece attended the China International Import Exposition in Shanghai at the beginning of this month, which was immediately followed by the state visit of the Chinese president to Greece. The visit was very successful. 16 agreements were signed in a joint statement, which in paragraph nine mentions that, I quote, the two sides will implement the MOU on cooperation within with the framework of the Silk Road Economic Belt and 21st Century Maritime Silk Road Initiative through cooperation projects such as the Port of Piraeus and implementing the 2020-2022 cooperation plans in key areas. The two sides will strengthen customs cooperation on trade facilitation and security, both bilaterally and in the framework of the China-Europe Land Sea Express Line." End of quote. The Chinese president, the statements underline the fact that China and Greece see each other as natural allies in developing the Belt Road. China is also participating in the Greek initiative of the Forum of Ancient Civilizations that was inaugurated in Athens in April 2017 and that promotes the knowledge and the ancient cultures of the Belt Road civilizations. In conclusion, the implementation and follow-up of the agreements signed between, between the two sides will determine the amount of investments that will reach Greece, its people, and if Piraeus from fifth in Europe in container movements can become the biggest port in Europe. Nevertheless, Greece's important role in developing the Belt Road is guaranteed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chrysantopoulos. Um, now we are going to hear from um, Mr. Alain Corvès, who is a consultant in international strategy from France, and he's going to speak about pragmatism against ideologies. And after that, we are going to have a possibility for short question and answer period. So I would like to, first of all, thank you, Mr. Mrs. LaRouche, for this invitation, and also Mr. Jacques Cheminade. So if I'm with you since a certain time and associated with the, uh, the ideas of Mr. LaRouche, it's because I share these ideas, of course, and I think they can be a source 
of a new energy, as uh, De Gaulle was referring to. So I'm going to try to give you a, a broad overview of geopolitics. I think we are in a very crucial moment in history, in the history of humanity. And uh, we are... Uh, Dans un monde qui va être complètement nouveau. Je vais essayer de suivre le fil de mon, le texte que j'ai donné aux interprètes pour qu'il n'y ait pas trop de difficultés. J'aurais aimé m'en éloigner un peu plus, mais. To, uh, I will help them in their task, the translators. I think. Uh, what has been called. So what used to be called the equilibrium of terror during the times of the confrontation between the two opposite ideologies of total laissez-faire capitalism, supported by the United States on one side and of communist collectivism on the other side, supported by the USSR. So this so-called equilibrium of terror collapsed with the dissolution of one of the protagonists in this unstable equilibrium, which dictated that the two imperialism could not confront each other directly due to the fear of the mutual destruction that the atomic bomb would provoke inevitably. So this equilibrium collapsed. So this capitalist ideology, which is material, as materialistic as uh, the uh, uh, USSR ideology, deprived from any sentiment of uh, spirituality or transcendence or even a basic humanism. It believed itself to have been designated to a universal destiny which the Uni United States, a so-called indispensable nation, a new Jerusalem or a new Rome, had to accomplish for the good of humanity. So that mission became a brutal imperialism destroying the world by wars, all supposedly based on great principles and essentially essentially taking place in the complicated East where millions of lives and, and uh, universal uh, monuments were destroyed. This imperialism increasingly encountered a fierce resistance Increasingly efficient, which brought the new president of the United States, Mr. Trump, to the logical conclusion that it was henceforth in the interest of the United States to put an end to these endless wars. He's an anti-ideologue. He's a pragmatic personality. And as he was a businessman, his pragmatism has run up against the ideology. So he adapted the United States to a new, a new world. And he, he said so since his campaign, we have to stop these endless wars. And we have to discuss with the other nations of the world. So he completely overthrew the prevalent uh, system that was uh, uh, the past, the past system. But the American deep state, which has no intention to give up the supremacy of the American dollar and uh, US norms. So 
these uh, intentions is a, a refusal resulting in their desolating attempts in all bad faith to impeach the uh, President of the United States for so-called collusion with Russia. And now, for what he supposedly did in, in Ukraine. And these people are absolutely convinced that Donald Trump is their enemy. He should not be elected, re-elected. That explains all the incoherence, incoherences, uh, the contradictory statements from the uh, the United States government. Donald Trump wants to wants to do what what is best for his, for the United States, but all these forces inside his own government are saying no, we don't want this. And so if he doesn't want to be impeached, he has to give guarantees to this uh, deep state. But I think he's going forward in the direction he, he wants to follow. So hence the realism of the emerging or re-emerging powers of Russia, China, India, Pakistan, they defend their interests and they regroup in political, economical, and even strategic organization, organizations such as the BRICS or the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, obliging the world to abandon pure ideology and uh, return to some form of pragmatism a Westphalian nations opposed to the empires and defending their pragmatic interests, while on the other side understanding and respecting those of the others. So I think that Europe, I mean by that the uh, European Union, should be inspired from this realism and abandon a suffocating and paralyzing ideology that makes him impotent and incapable of playing any role in any major crisis and even of defending its own interests. So Europe's incapacity to counter the United States in Iran is a sad example of that. And so its submission inside NATO and US norms and command are another one. So he made a very interesting speech at the UN General Assembly. It has, it has not been echoed in any media in Europe at least, since we have a complete control of billionaires on the French media and they criticize uh, Donald Trump. Any example that can be taken from uh, uh, its positive views is taken away. So you have to read his speeches uh, from the beginning to the end. And the core of his, uh, of his speech is that the world has changed and we have to adapt to it. So he is defending uh, uh, the various national forms of patriotism and sovereignty. So I'm going to give you the example of Syria now. So I was in Damascus uh, in September. So we have been uh, invited by President Bashar al-Assad with a delegation. So he made an expose in his house 
where he's, he talked about the geopolitical uh, geopolitics of the world, and he's a very, very cultivated man. He described the world, and he he, he placed the Syrian crisis inside world politics. And he said that the Syrian crisis is a, one of the best examples of the expression of this rebellion, a world rebellion against uh, Wall Street. I'm, I'm really citing him, I'm really quoting him. The Syrian crisis, he said, assembles all the elements of a world resistance of a free and sovereign peoples against the imperialism of a world finance led by Wall Street, the city of London, and against a Europe which has no way to emancipate itself of, away from this tutorship without a full reset of its fundamentals. As an example, the Shah mentioned French President Macron, who, has, who was put in power by this oligarchy and did away with the traditional parties and can only suppose that oligarchy in words, while eventually understanding that those forces who put him into power are on the verge of ruin, is a very intelligent person and knows that the people who brought him into power are on the verge of ruin. The popular outcry all over the world are the people's revolt against the financial oligarchy, which are, are squeezing the lower and middle classes in Europe. So our friend from Greece just explained us what happened to, in, in Greece. That's only an example. The Yellow Vest in France and other peoples elsewhere around the planet, like in Lebanon also, All this is explaining us that the resistance is really coordinating. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you the. Uh, so he continued. Bashar Assad continued by saying, "The workers of all countries are the blood of the nations, and in Syria, despite the war, the social services were maintained." and the workers participate in the political deliberations and the management of their activities. He said, the world map shows the war between financial wealth in the hands of only a tiny minority getting more and more rich and a vast majority of dispossessed. The US military bases spread over the planet to defend the domination of the dollar against which nations as Russia and China arise. So he precised that there is a connection between the conflicts in Syria and in the South China Sea, as Beijing is fully aware. So now let's talk about the Chinese Silk Road project. It is with the perspective to end the conflicts arising from opposite interests and therefore to end the wars that the Chinese New Silk Road Initiative, which is also called uh, One Bell One Road, and you know all about it, so the aim is to build the land and sea infrastructures, establish syn synergies between the patchy capacities of nations in natural resources and financial means by signing agreements with each other, with the, where each country will recognize its own interests, a win-win policy. And this is uh, in all domains of human, human activity, uh, notably in the area of scientific research, which should allow humanity to develop the indispensable de technologies required by human development. So Lyndon, Lyndon Rouge proposed in 1975 a project called OASIS. It was a plan to manage and develop the water resources of the Middle East to the great benefit of Egypt, as well as Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, and Israel. 
it was proposing a united harmoniously Uh, it was proposing to mobilize the hydro resources of the region for great water management projects in the area connecting the uh, uh, the Death Sea with the Red Sea and the Mediterranean. And by uh, creating entirely new resources by the construction of nuclear desalination plants. was supposed to be installed in both sides and whose fresh water production was to be shared among all parties. And this project, which would have been uh, at the benefit of the entire region and uproot of one of the causes of conflict, of course, it has been denigrated and finally refused by the forces opposing, opposing peace, both in the United States and Israel. So I'm going to talk about General de Gaulle, who said in 1960, uh, 1966, in his address at the University of uh, Mexico, a very famous speech. And of course, he, he was addressing this speech to all the intellectuals of the world. He said, quote, Indeed, beyond the distances that are shrinking, beyond the ideologies that are weakening and the political systems that are losing steam and unless humanity destroys itself someday sorry indeed beyond the distances that are shrinking beyond the ideologies that are weakening and the political systems that are losing steam and unless humanity destroys itself someday in a monstrous self-destruction, the fact that will dominate the future is the unity of our universe. One cause, that of man. One necessity, that of world progress. And consequently, of assistance to all those countries that desire, that desire it in order to develop. One duty, that, that of peace. This constitute the very basis of existence for our species. I thank you very much. Should we take this microphone for the table? Okay, so thank you very much, Mr. Krasantopoulos and um, Mr. Corvez. I think this was uh, very beautiful as a conclusion of our first uh, panel because you really showed in both of your speeches how it is a visionary image of man which will create the future and that it's a Pro Promethean image of man. Uh, which is creativity, which is alone able to really yeah, solve the problems and give the impetus and, and the strength to fight all the problems which we have to deal with today. So now we have a um, possibility for a round of questions to our two speakers here. And if you want to say something or ask something, please uh, go there to the microphone. Take the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. <coughs> Hello to all. I'm George. I have two little questions. One for Sheikh Sheminan and one for Mr. Corbez. I want to know why the uh, nuclear power plant of, uh, of Congo, which was built in uh, 
56. Nobody talks about it. It's like Africa has nothing. First question. A second question. How will we create a space law to not colonize space? All the small countries are fighting that they are also able to send satellites. Can we use the new... Are we going to pollute in the same way the space as we did with the oceans? Je n'étais pas au courant. I cannot answer your questions because I don't have the facts. Uh, uh, this, I don't know why a nuclear power plant in Congo and why it never was upstarted. I, I don't realize it was ever built. You realize how everything is hidden about Africa. Y a-t-il d'autres questions euh, aux orateurs I think we have heard a lot already now again. And with that, I would like to close this first panel and other uh, and uh, ask Odile to come up here and to for the moderation of our second panel, which is the fundamental scientific issues of the future and the new space Silk Road. So please, let's move on.